long days, pleasant nights, and welcome to Kingslingers, a Doof Media podcast journeying through Stephen King's Dark Tower series. My name is constant reader Scott Daly, and this is my co-host, who I pushed into reading this series. It's Matt Freeman. How's it going, Matt? It's going well, Scott. I've got my uh, lighter in this inner pocket of my coat here, my lucky lighter, and I think it'll keep me nice and safe throughout this recording session today. Yeah, nice and safe and warm. Mm-hmm. Uh, no adverse effects at all. At yeah, all. I'm, I'm a doobie, or yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the funny thing about that is when you say it out loud, all I hear is doobie like... Like a doobie. Like a, like a doobie, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Amazing. I was going to make a, a, a joke about the stand and the coronavirus that's happening right now, but then I remembered you haven't read that book, and that makes it not fun, so... And also, depending on how the next month goes, that could just oh, yeah. be that, really not funny at all. But, yeah, um, it's like a Stephen King and the Challenger explosion joke he made. Jesus, Stephen. <laughs> yeah, Jesus, Stephen. like that. Wow. <laughs> all right. This week on the show, we are finishing up the drawing of the three, Matt. We're finishing it up. We're going to finish the book this week. We're talking about part three, The Pusher, and I'm very excited to talk about it. I am, too. This is super fun. Yeah. So in this in this week's reading, Roland enters the body of the pusher named Jack Mort, a monster who loves pushing things onto people and people in front of things. Jack is responsible for dividing Odetta both times and is introduced scheming to do the same thing to our old pal, Jake Chambers. Roland commandeers his body and holds up a gun store in a pharmacy to get his medicine. In the end, he forces Odetta and Detta to confront each other. And through the power of love, they consolidate to form Susanna Dean. Having drawn the three, Roland and his team leave the beach and head on their journey towards the tower. Matt, what did you think of this week's reading? Uh, I, I think I've used the word fun to describe pretty much every section of this book. So I think overall, this book is just really fun. Yeah, um, I think when the word continues to be true, you keep using the word. It's, it's one of the more fun books I've ever read, maybe. I, I mean, That's awesome. It, it's, it's interesting because it's very different from The Gunslinger, and I really liked The Gunslinger, but it's just so different in terms of how it feels and the mm-hmm. emotions it, it puts in you like i don't think i said the gunslinger was fun that doesn't mean i didn't enjoy it but like this is just a a ride you know yeah i mean i, I was for, for whatever reason that i don't quite understand and maybe we can look back at this when we're further into the story but this third of this book is the part i remember the least i remember eddie dean's part very well i remember um odetta and Detta's part very well, but this third of the book is the part that I just didn't have, like, if you had asked me before I read it again in preparation for the show, I don't know if I'd be able, like, I knew Jack Mort, and I knew basically how Susanna Dean is created, and I knew all that, but I didn't remember the specifics of it, and yeah, I, I really, really enjoyed this too. It's a lot, a lot of fun. Yeah, I can't wait to talk about this in detail. Yeah, so let's waste no further time. And let's get into it. Let's talk about it. So we begin this week's section with chapter one of part three entitled Bitter Medicine. We begin the chapter with Roland entering the pusher and we're immediately told by King how different this part of the story is going to go. With Eddie, Roland's presence had a small feeling of being watched. Detta noticed the presence immediately, which is something that uh, that you and I pointed out when we were in that section. Um, And then this little nice note from King here that I really like. She hadn't just sensed him in a queer way. It seemed that she had been waiting for him, him or or another more frequent visitor. Mm -hmm. Um, That's really good. But the pusher, Jack Mort, doesn't notice Roland at all because he is too busy looking at the boy. Yes. Um, And this is such a a surprise and it really throws you through for a complete loop. Um, I think at the beginning of this chapter, I want to talk about this idea of of the pusher, the name, right? And I did a little little control F on just the pusher. Um, And it's funny because it only really shows up once before it shows up on the door. And that is when Eddie is thinking to himself uh, while he's pushing Odetta's uh, uh, um, wheelchair. He thinks, all those years you spent as a junkie, and guess what? You're finally the pusher, Um, (laughs) which is just purely funny there. Like, it's not ominous or foreshadowing or anything, really. Um, And and then we get here to this guy, and it takes on just this horribly macabre, uh, evil usage, which I really want to explore. Absolutely. And and this is, oh, Matt, last week was tough for me. Last week was really tough for me. This is the part that I think you got so close to getting to last week. And it's never been harder for me to like, like there was part of me that really wanted to just push you a little bit towards uh-huh. making that final connection, connecting those final dots. Um, we were talking about last week, like, what does the pusher mean to Odetta? What does the pusher mean to Eddie? 
but what does the pusher mean to Roland? Yeah. And I was I was like in the back of like I had to stop myself. I had to be like, no, I got to <laughs> let him if he's going to figure it out. I got to let him figure it out. And if he doesn't, we can just wait till next week. But of course, what is the pusher to Roland? Well, the pusher is Jake because Jake was pushed by the man in black. Yeah, I think I was just like naming situations that involve something being pushed. But yeah. the, the, I mean, like, yeah, OK, I missed out on this one for sure. Um, I think that the thing is, like, it it didn't occur to me that the word would be used in such a like straightforward way. Like sure. I was looking for sort of metaphorical usages and it's like, no, no, it's literally this one man who's pushing <laughs> everyone. <laughs> right. Like the, the name of the pusher is literally just that's what he does. Yeah. He pushes. Um, I, I think you could be have some fun with it, though, like in the other meanings of the pusher, like is is Roland a pusher in some way? I don't know. He could be. Um, yeah, you could have fun with it. But yeah, I know. I think the, the most straightforward meaning, like I think you even commented on that last week when you were like, well, I mean, someone pushes Odetta in a wheelchair, but surely it can't be. Yeah, that, it can't be that simple. Um, and I was like, yeah, no, it, it is. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I should be. I shouldn't be afraid to be literal. I mean, he 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 did the same thing with the word drawing where yeah. every possible usage of the word drawing sort of shows up if only as almost like a casual throwaway reference like pants yeah. being something that you draw on, for example. Sure. sure. Um, yeah, I mean, he, yeah. he has he's he has a lot of fun with words and yeah, I think I think making this assumption that the literal meaning is definitely going to be used on top of some metaphorical meanings, uh, I think would be a fair one with a lot of the words King uses for sure. Yeah, I, I mean, I wonder, and obviously you can't tell me, but I definitely wonder if he's going to continue this motif of kind of picking a word to play with, um, and and, and having it resonate throughout the story uh, in in the way that the words drawing and pusher specifically have in this book i mean i almost want to go back to to uh, a gunslinger and and just think about whether there wasn't something similar in that book that that was there that i just didn't notice uh, yeah I, I don't um know. for gunslinger i can't think of anything nothing's like immediately jumping to mind but i know this is something king does generally so mm-hmm. i would not be surprised if we're talking having this a very similar conversation in book three or book four or mm-hmm. beyond yeah cool yeah. I really like this line, Matt, here where uh, he says, the boy who had said, go then, there are other worlds than these before plunging into the abyss. And sure enough, the boy had been right. The boy was Jake. I just I just love that. I, just, like, I think that's really cool. It's really cool. And I think it's specifically cool to me because it sequences the information in a way where you're like, the boy, the wait, that boy? Wait, yeah, no. Yeah. And then and then it confirms that it is Jake, like right. la, like last. And you and you're like, oh my god. So yeah, it's yeah. it's great. Um, yeah. And and of course the assumption we get is that this we are now back in 1977 or 80 or I forget what Jake's year was, but we're back in that year. So we're just jumping around time all over the place here. We were in the late 80s with Eddie. We were in um, 64 with Odetta and Detta, mm-hmm. and now we are in uh, 80 again with, mm-hmm. with Jakey Boy. Yep. So let's meet Jack Mort. Jack Mort is a CPA by trade and a pusher by hobby. <laughs> and we see here that he's about to push, push Jake into the street, which is the same way Jake died last time. But last time, uh, Jake said it was the man in black who pushed him, wasn't it? Roland, I think we see Roland like panic with this knowledge, thinking he's inside the man in black or or at least that he'll see him. Uh, but he can't resist himself and he charges forward into Jack Mort's mind and takes control of him immediately, which is just long enough for the light to change and Jake to go on his way. Um, Roland sees this whole thing play out and concludes that because Walter was nowhere to be seen because he didn't see him, this was not the correct win for the push. It was close, but not here. I think he says maybe one day off, maybe two weeks off, something like that. And relaxing, he goes into the background of Jack Mort's mind. And that's really the opening salvo of this, this section. So what do you think about all this, Matt? Did any of this surprise you? Oh, for sure. It blew my mind. Um, uh, I mean, for, first of all, just the idea at, at first it tantalizes you and teases you with this idea that we're going to get a chance to maybe save Jake and, and, you know, undo the mistake that Roland made. And I was like, wow, what a, what a fantastic twist to give him at this point in the story, the opportunity to undo what he did. And the cool thing is he sort of in spirit does because like without yeah. even thinking he, he stops, um, he stops Jack Mort, but it doesn't necessarily mean anything. In fact, it probably doesn't mean anything at all. Um, but just the fact that he stopped it, I think, feels good to us. Like to, to know that 
he he's the kind of man who having made that choice in the first place would sort of unthinkingly react in a way that that would at least try to undo it when when given the chance um, yeah so that's one thing to say about this and kind of how i reacted to it emotionally but then there's a whole other thing where um the like like this the the details come into play like like okay so for example I, do we actually know that the man in black pushed jake because he gets pushed and then the man in black walks up and, and gives him the last rites. But it was our assumption that the man in black pushed Jake because there was no other, there was no evidence that anything other than that happened. But now that we know like, well, there was this, there was potentially this guy who loves pushing people in front of things and wanted to push Jake in front of a car who should have been the one to push him. And then Roland removed him from the equation. So now what's going to happen? Like this is the man in black. Like, like, um, I don't know. Like, if if Jack Mort wasn't the one who pushed Jake, then like it's too coincidental, or or it it's it it st- it sticks out. Like, does the universe want to push Jake into the street? <laughs> Did the Man yeah. in Black like try to use Mort for this purpose, like psychically drawing him toward him for for this purpose, and then ending up having to change plans at a later point? Like like why is why is there this fixation on killing Jake in this particular way of pushing him in front of a car? I, I, I know I'm just kind of like jumbling up nonsense questions here but i'm sort of trying to capture the the feeling of uh where i am with with this and and like my my confusion and and curiosity yeah i mean i i think that's fair and i think rereading this section and not remembering exactly how all this plays out um i think there is some designed confusion around this because there is this moment where the text is like Roland wasn't even conscious of the fact that he might be creating a paradox Mm -hmm. like it like that what would happen would would it destroy his entire quest if he saves Jake here because then Jake would never have come to him and then he could not have sacrificed him to get to the man in black what would that do and and he just kind of sh- like like waves it away very quickly um and just kind of moves on and and it's like he acted on instinct there he he didn't even think about those things um but the book introduces those concepts to you but it definitely does not conclude on them i think the one clear thing we have here the one thing we absolutely certainly know is roland leaves this interaction saying this must not be the right time that this is not the time jake was pushed because i do not see the man in black that is the decision he comes to and that's really all we have to go off of here yeah it still leaves me with a lot of questions but yeah i I get that but i designed questions sure yeah yeah. exactly yeah yeah that's my my confusion is i think an intended like series of questions that i want answered yeah and and i think the cool thing about it is to your point, um, even though we are uncertain about what all this means and the why and the how of it and the confusion around that, I think it is not, not redemption certainly, but like it is nice to see Roland without thinking, see this opportunity to save the boy he abandoned. Um, and he takes it like that. It is like, Again, like I think a lot of this book is not trying to make you like Roland, but see that there is another side to Roland um, beyond just the I'm going to fucking kill you all for my tower part. Like see the person in him that loves. Yeah, I think you see that regardless of what all the background stuff behind it is. Yeah, I mean, I think this book does a lot of work in terms of making him like very likable and admirable in every regard that has nothing to do with the tower. And then as yeah. far as the tower is concerned, you still don't really get it and you're and, yeah. and it's and it's bad. Yeah, I, I love the way the book ends in that regard. I can't I can't wait to get there to that very end. Where it's like this this wonderful triumphant moment. And then boom, yeah. <laughs> the tower's back. It's great. Right. Yeah. So um, before we move on from this part, I just wanted to focus on like the continuing evolution of the word Ka in this series. There's been a lot of Ka throughout the series, but I think this section has the most of it. And I think that makes sense because we're in Roland's head more in this part of the book than we have been in a while. But we see two mentions of it here very early in part three, and I think they're both interesting and both worth looking worth looking at. Um, one of them is when um, Roland is first recognizing that this is it. This is the moment Jake dies, and he freaks out about it, and he said, he's going to do it. He's going to do it right now. That's to be my punishment for murdering him in my world, to see him murdered in this one before I can stop it. But the rejection of brutish destiny had been the gunslinger's work all his life. It had been his ka, if you please. And so he came forward without even thinking acting with reflexes so deep they had nearly become instincts and then later 
when Roland backs out of that coming forward and how it has an important realization that we're going to get to in a second, it, it, the the phrase is divorced of his body, his mind, his ka was as healthy and acute as ever. But the sudden knowing struck him like a chisel blow to the temple. So we understand basically from the very first use of the word in the story, we understood ka as a type of destiny, a book, a plan in which all things are written down, in which Roland puts his trust into. But also here, it seems to be like a kind of spiritual representation, like mind or soul, if you will. I think I think we're far enough into the books now, Matt, where I can comfortably say that it's going to be this evolving concept, and this evolving concept is going to play a role in the book to come. And it's one of those words that the book just does and doesn't have a clear defined meaning to but i mean to be fair like how do you describe the meaning of of the word soul to a person who had never heard of that concept before like how do you do it it's just difficult it's just kind of nebulous and i think that's what kai is it's just kind of this nebulous force both a destiny and a soul and a counter destiny we see here it's it's very interesting yeah it's nebulous and yet it seems to be concrete in the in the sense that it it does things yes um yeah, I mean, like you said, Ka is now made distinct from brutish destiny. He, he considers yeah. it his Ka to avert destiny, which is yeah. really a contradiction uh, to the <laughs> it idea. It is my destiny to, to revert destiny. Yeah, I mean, if, if Ka were just fate, then that wouldn't really make sense. So that there, therefore, it must be a bit more complicated than that. Like, it, mm-hmm. it's this kind of personal, individual essence of some kind. Uh, I mean, it is right now hard for me to, like put it all together in, into a coherent picture and, and get a get a coherent understanding. I think that's fine. Like, as you said, we're, we're meant to continue to explore this concept. Um, I think last week I would have said, like, yeah, uh, cause fate, cause karma. Mm-hmm. And now I'm like, uh, no, because, like, th- well, there's different ways of thinking about fate. Yeah. So, like, is, is fate whatever ends up happening or is fate the force that tries to make the right thing happen like you, you could use the word fate in english to mean both of those things sure um sure i don't know we'll, we'll see i guess we will we will see and yeah i mean i i think you will be able to use more words to describe what ka is going forward into the book but it's just going to be an interesting thing that i think we're going to have to continually go back to because it I, I think again to go back to the the statement of the one clear thing we know is that Roland sees it as this force that is controlling his actions to a certain extent or or dictating his actions to a certain extent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so. So, all right. Um, so f- the, we, the, we have this part I want to really, really talk to you about. This, this quote is so good. The third was not this man, the pusher. The third named by Walter had been death, death but not for you. That was what Walter, clever as Satan, even at the end, had said. A lawyer's answer, so close to the truth that the truth was able to hide in its shadow. Death was not for him. Death was become him. The prisoner, the lady, death was the third. He was suddenly filled with the certainty that he himself was the third. So that's wonderful. It's great. And there's a bunch to say about it. Uh, So first of all, I don't think Roland has mentioned the word Satan yet. Um, so that's, that's another specific proper noun. Um, yeah, I mean, mythology. it makes sense with all our, our biblical references um, yeah. that we've seen in the past that, that Satan would, would come into play here. But I sure. think you're right. Yeah, I mean, the, the, reason why, the, the reason I pay attention to this is that I still am very curious as to why he doesn't recognize the Isaac reference, but he <laughs> recognizes like every other one. I'm like, well, that's, I mean, I mean, it would be kind of funny if he just like literally didn't hear that story for some random reason. Yeah, but, yeah. but 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 also like it, it is I, I want to read into into it like something something that distinguishes Roland's world from our world. What why would that story have not been part of what he's familiar with when everything else was? Um, yeah, yeah, true. And then of course the second thing is that uh, I like that the book has trained us that when Roland has a kind of bolt of sudden certainty about something, he's just right. Like. He, you and I don't need to be like, well, maybe he's jumping the gun here and, and, and like war game it out. Like when Roland has sudden insights, he's right. And this is good because then you don't establish like, like it, it allows you to establish some way of having certainties in this realm of, of, sure. of abstract magical cost stuff. Um, it, it would be really easy to become ungrounded in the story. And so it's really nice actually to have a way for the narrator, for the, for the storyteller to be like, this is this. Sure. And, and then you're just like, okay, 
good. Well, okay, counterpoint here, Matt. Uh-huh. Maybe maybe Roland's jumping the gun here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think you are generally true, and I think that is a truism for Stephen King in general, that he uses like character realizations to reveal things. And a lot of his stories, including these ones, when a character comes to the sudden powerful realization, it is, it is usually something that is just flat out unquestionably true. Um, with this one, I, I don't know, because the thing about this is like, I don't think King ever really makes this 100% clear because there are so many different, like the three, who are the three, right? Um, because that could mean a bunch of different things. That could mean Roland, Eddie, and Susanna. That could mean Detta, Odetta, and Susanna. I mean, th- there are many, many different interpretations that could be here. Um, and I think Roland has latched onto this one, and it's right as much as any of them are right, in that, sure, I will accept that. Yeah, and I mean, there's a certain sense in which, uh, like, we, we don't really know the, the three what, right? <laughs> I mean, right, exactly. T- yeah. te- technically, uh, uh, Jack Mort is the third that he the, he's the third door. That's for sure. Yeah. But then he just kills him. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, uh, and then, of course, there's there's the idea that he he made you know may, maybe Susanna is the third. Yeah. And, and that the this, the book sort of says that at the end, and I'm like. Well, if Susanna's the third, then who is the second? <laughs> like, 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 and and that it's fine. Like, I don't, I don't want, I don't need it to be super nailed down and literal. I just think that at the end of the book, we have Roland, Susanna, and Eddie. One, two, three. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm good with that being the three. <laughs> that, yeah. that, that's what makes the most sense to me in the most literal way. Certainly, certainly, and and I think, I think Roland is. As much as we've given Roland a hard time, I think he can be pretty uncharitable to himself. And I love, like, I love this idea of like, well, of course, I am the, de- I am death. I am the third. Um, I am the one that brings death. I brought death to Jake, and here in this moment, maybe, maybe the whole thing is a big trick that I'm going to be the one that pushes Jake into the street. I love that realization of his that he's, he's going to have to experience doing it and be powerless to stop it. I love that. Um, so yeah, I mean, it certainly does line up, but I don't think the book is ever going to be like, or does rather ever say like, yes, this is a hundred percent right because mm-hmm. it is much more loose than that. Yeah. yeah, and I'm fine with that. Sure, sure. Yeah. All right. So on the way out of the front of Jake Mort's mind, Roland catches glimpses of the past, a past that will serve to connect Jack Mort to Odetta. We zoom back to that past and we really get to see who Jack Mort is for the first time. And he's a monster, (laughs) Matt. He's more of a monster than we've ever seen in this book. Worse than Roland at his absolute worst. Worse than Detta at her absolute worst. Jack Mort, it turns out, is the man that dropped the brick on the five-year-old Odetta. And as we'll learn, he is the same man that pushed the adult version of Odetta in front of the train. He is both of those people. He did both of those things. And he's awful. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, Detta and Eddie are rough around the edges for sure. But they've they've got their demons that drive them or maybe push them, if you will. Uh, Roland struggles with his inner conflict. He never really forgives himself for making these terrible choices that he sort of almost seems supernaturally locked into making. The difference between all of our characters that we like and Mort is that um, they all have something pushing them. But <laughs> Mort just is this way. Like he enjoys being this way. He seems happy being this way. Ugh, yeah, he does. And uh, I hate him. Yeah, me too. And King does such a good job making you hate him, doesn't he? It's not just the the literal nature of of what he does, but it's how he does it. The pleasure he takes in it, both the mental and physical pleasure. Like once again, we have this connection of um of violence and sexuality here, right? Where one of the things that happens to Jack Mort every time he pushes something on someone is he he comes in his pants every mm-hmm. time and he wears this baggy sweatshirt to cover up that wet spot. And and it's this again, King has taken the seedy, disturbing kind of sexual gratification and connecting it with violence. I, I don't think it's a a coincidence that Detta also takes sexual pleasure in the harm she commits on people and that the man that made her like made her did the same thing yeah that's really interesting i mean it connects back to like alice finding this sexual thrill in walter odim's weird necromancy sylvia pittston's demon baby uh the sex oracle um i mean yeah we've got lots of data points tying together sex violence and magic in this story yeah Yeah, yeah. and I, i mean i admit i'm hoping that we get some kind of framework for understanding 
why this might be because it's a very interesting idea. But currently, it's just something that we have to take at face value that this is this is sort of how it is. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, I'm reminded of Carrie's uh, psychic powers reawakening when she hit Monarchy. Mm-hmm. Like, like that was this the signal, and that's that's so, sort of a similar idea of tying up sex and and blood and and magic in, in a certain sense. Um, sure, but it, you know, in, in, in that book, um, I mean, I guess it was sort of a metaphor for adulthood. Yeah. Um, in this book, I'm trying to find out what the what the underlying idea is, what we're doing with this um, this pattern. Sure, sure. And I think we'll just keep paying attention to that and see if that answer reveals itself as we go through the yeah. story. Yeah. Another thing that really disturbs me about Jack Mord is the sequence where he's just like philosophizing and getting excited about like throwing a brick out into the world and it creating these like ripples of horrible grief and trauma. Oh yeah. And, and he just and I'm just like, oh my god, this is like. I'm skin is crawling with his yeah it's awful yeah one thing I I think I think King does a really good job of especially with his more monstrous characters is give them a thing like a memorable tick or some grand universal unifying theory on the world that defines them for Jack Mort it's the concept of doobies and don't bees like leaving fingerprints being conspicuous these are things for the don't bees doobies know better doobies don't get caught because they're smarter than anyone else they plan ahead and i was just reading um i'm kind of like in the background of this whole project doing this thing where i'm rereading all stephen king books from in publishing order from beginning to end Mm. and i'm on i just reread the langoliers and there's a uh, the the bad character in that book is a person named mr toombs um king is is sometimes very obvious with his names for the bad characters matt Uh like mort um Yes, yes, like Mort. Um, and Mr. Toombs has this tick where he like, like whenever he gets stressed out, he rips paper very slowly. Um, and it's just like this thing that King does, like that he just consistently does. And this do bees and don't bees is Jack Mort's. And it really also really helps you hate him because like, be ready, be prepared, be a doobie. King Jack Mort's success, secret for success, both at work and at play. Ugh, and that's so despicable. It's so awful. I know. Uh, King really is a genius. Uh, I mean, like this this normal, just slightly off presentation of Jack Mort is just so much creepier than if he were like obviously outwardly evil. Like yeah, he yeah. he comes off as almost normal, like ninety five percent normal, but then there's the like five percent off that just makes your skin crawl. Yeah, and it's like he's he's super successful at his job, right? Because he's got this doobie philosophy and he does it he does that as a job and he's very successful at it. But that 5% you're talking about, we'll we'll see later in the chapter makes everyone around him uncomfortable. Yeah. Even though even though Roland's in the 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 in control of Jack Mort when he sees his coworkers, they are just immediately uncomfortable around him and it's almost as if King is saying that like Yes, he's really good at faking everything and he's very smart and successful at this stuff, but that evil seeps out of him no matter what he can do. Yeah, it's great. I want to tell a quick Lingalier story though. When I was a kid, my family watched it and my brother can't have been older older than like six. He was probably like five. <laughs> and uh and we're all like eating out and he and he just kind of randomly without really making a big deal of it, just like picks up a napkin at the restaurant and like rolls his eyes back into his head and starts slowly ripping the napkin. Oh my and, God. and it just we all just completely lost it. It was it was one of those moments of just like memorable forever uh family times, you know. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. That is one of those movies. I think I actually saw that that I think it was a TV miniseries, not a a, a, a theater feature length film. Um, I think I saw that before I read it. And I remember that really messed me up, too, because it's not good. <laughs> like, it's a bad it's bad. It's yeah. very bad. The book is fun. I enjoyed the, the, the story. But um, I remember we used to fly a lot because my dad's a pilot. And after I saw the Langoliers, I tried to make myself go to sleep every time. I was on an airplane because mm-hmm. I was like, you never know. <laughs> it's one of those things that like it didn't scare me, but it did like completely impact my behavior for uh-huh. a long time. That's interesting. It's really interesting. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, yeah. So Roland, having seen all of this, asks himself one, I think, very important question. What sort of man is this that I am supposed to use? What sort of man? And that's a that's a pretty good question there, Matt. Let's talk about this. Sure. Roland doesn't usually ask himself this kind of question. The Mm -hmm. book delights in pointing out to us that Roland doesn't usually ask himself this kind of question. 
Uh, but Jack Mord is just so jarring, so horrible, yeah. that merely being in his head is making a role in question his life choices. He's like, Jesus, this is one of my three? Like, man, do I even want right. to do this anymore? It's yeah, great. Yeah, it is great. But, I mean, do you, do you think there's an easy answer here? Like, if we're looking at this whole thing, and we like we can see the Eddie Dean part of him. We can see the Detta, Odetta, Susanna part of him. Um, is Is Jack Mort supposed to be uh Roland reckoning with the worst side of himself in in some ways. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I mean is what Roland does with Jack Mort is is what he ends up doing with him the thing that he was meant to do? Is this the use he was meant to put him through? Like like to to use him as a as a vehicle and discard him? I mean are, are, I guess are are you are you saying that you think maybe it's having to do like force him to confront this kind of a monster? and and deal with that kind of reflection on his own behavior yeah i mean i i don't know for sure but i think that sounds reasonable to me like i think if we look at each of the the three um and by the three i mean the three door people not the 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 three drawn right you know what i mean um as a reflection of a part a side of roland um then I think that there's certainly part of that. I mean, again, we go back to to Jake. We've linked Mort to Roland through Jake. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's some interesting ideas that kind of sprout from that. Like, what is that? What does that mean? Like, what? Like, obviously, I think the book doesn't want you to feel bad about what Roland does to Jack Mort here. And I don't. I don't feel bad about this guy. He's an absolute monster. He deserves everything he gets. 100%. But yeah, I mean, like if everything is playing according to Ka or whatever else we're calling this now, um, it certainly seems like the th- these things played out because they were supposed to. That by the time Roland was desperate enough to need medicine and didn't ha- and would, didn't have time to fuck around anymore, he was thrown into the body of someone who he would have no qualms treating like shit, um, but also like taking out his frustrations on himself. Like he is just disgusted by Jack Moore. Like we hate him too, but Roland is just like, like, like he takes pleasure in what he does to this guy. Um, yeah. And, and, and I do see part of that at least as, as punishing himself in the ways that he, he can't otherwise. Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, certainly, uh, Roland is, is this, you know, perfectly he's, he's the most badass guy in the world, but he literally like, <laughs> like faints like, like he, He's he's so horrified that he like loses consciousness for hours just due to like exposure to how awful this guy's mind is. Yeah, yeah. And it's a it's a sign of how overwhelming he finds this and how kind of uh like deeply, profoundly spiritually disgusted he is at the idea that like this is one of his that this guy might be one of his three that he's supposed to draw and and you like, yeah, I think that's one thing that maybe it's easy to forget after you've finished the story is like at this point for all we know, he's supposed to draw Jack Mort. He's supposed to bring yeah. Jack Mort in, into his world and be like, all right, man, you're you're one of my bros now. We're going to be friends, and, and I'm going to have to be around you for, for forever. And we're just like, oh, no, I really don't like where this is going. Yeah, and there's there's a real sense of progression amongst these three, right? Because you start with Eddie, who's this kid. He's, he made some mistakes. He's not a perfect kid. But overall, he seems like a nice guy, right? He's not terrible. And then you have uh, Odetta and Detta, who are literally like halfway between good and bad. You have the light side and the good side kind of taking turns there. And then the last one is Jack Mort, the literal monster, the literal awful human being and yeah so you're like okay there's a trend here and the trend is leading to worse and worse people Mm -hmm. and yeah i mean i i totally the first time i read this was like this is the guy like this is he's gonna go on his quest with this (laughs) this guy yeah right this is gonna be fun (laughs) yeah 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 so as you said um roland passes out because he's like like the the disgustingness of this man's mind is too much for him and he just kind of passes out um and he wakes up still inside Jack Mort not sure how much time has gone by but Mort is at an office now and as he watches Mort and it kind of quickly looks at the door behind him a plan forms um and he comes into Jack Mort and he looks behind him and sees Detta and like freaks out and so and the text says what the gunslinger didn't want was for the lady to see the lady. Um, so we kind of get a little hint at 
what the resolution of this conflict is going to be, but not exactly yet. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, it's uh, it's foreshadowing. It's set up and it works. Yes. It works yes. very well and very subtly. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think this is great, though, because we see Detta just like waiting calmly by the door and he yeah. doesn't even need to see Eddie to know that the kid has messed up real bad. <laughs> um, well, he was almost expecting it when he left, right? Yeah. That's the same that's the thing he was trying to warn Eddie of the whole last section and he just wouldn't listen yeah it's real great suspense i mean we've we've been into this so far and then and then he throws in this element of of like oh, oh okay well now data has his body and yeah, yeah yeah and so he knows he has to succeed here and he has a time limit to succeed because he knows eddie's in trouble um and that's how we end this first chapter uh, yep. it's really great so we move right into chapter two called the honeypot and we cut back to Detta Walker. So we did all of chapter one in Roland's head and we ended the chapter seeing that Detta had done exactly as Roland feared she did. And then we cut back in time and kind of see what happened on the other side of the door to get into that situation. So Detta Walker is watching Eddie and waiting for him to go to sleep. She's actually laying in a den, Matt, and mm-hmm. is like on top of a bunch of old bones. If you didn't need enough imagery to really understand who Detta Walker is yet. Um I would I would like to point out once again that the text through Detta emphasizes just how young Eddie looks when she gets a really good look of him when he comes near the den, but not seeing her. She also points out how young he looks. Yeah, there are these moments, I think, uh, you know, at the very end of the story where he's just acting really almost childish in, in a way that's endearing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I don't I, I don't have much to say about it other than I think maybe that's he sort of plays two roles. He plays the role of being like uh, the kid of the group, um, but also being Odetta's lover, which I don't know if we have a full sense of how that evolves after Odetta becomes Susanna, but um, I think we probably will understand that in the next book more yeah, clearly. I think you're right. Um, yeah. I, I did want to point out, I mean, uh, Detta is basically hunkering down in her own little go, uh, Golgotha. Yeah. Um, that, so, I, yeah. Honestly, that had never occurred to me before at all but i like it because we're we're reaching the end of this story and just like the end of the first story we we have that same thing happen i think you're right that's wonderful and it's drawing i think a subtle connection between her and the man in black maybe Um, right once again this like this idea that detta is is evil incarnate kind of mm -hmm. um, but still not as bad as jack (laughs) yeah right i mean detta is is a is a sensible person with goals compared to jack yeah (laughs) So Detta can't just kill Eddie because she really needs the really bad man, Roland, to take her back through the door. So instead, she just sits there and she waits. I love the torturous, slow roll of Eddie, like, trying as hard as he can to not fall asleep. And then it just ends up being futile. Like, he tr- he moves position. He wakes himself up. He walks down to the beach and splashes water in his face, only to just inevitably get so tired that he passes out. Yeah, I really like it. I love it. And we get this line here. She was surprised, disgusted, and frightened to feel a sudden stab of pity for the white boy down there. He looked nothing so much as a little squirt who had tried to stay up until midnight on New Year's Eve and lost the race. Yeah, that's great. Um, That's a great that's a great moment where she has these, uh, you know, injections of of, of feeling uh, that that she's not not happy about. I I do. I love, you know, you you pointing out how Eddie Eddie falling asleep. um, is just this this grinding experience. Uh, I love how King is able to squeeze so much drama out of these small little details and like the, just the mechanics and the circumstances. Uh, like like last week, it seemed like eighty percent of the conflict centered around the need to use this wheelchair to move people around and how difficult that was to do on sand and how they kept tipping over and like it's all it's all very pragmatic sort of pr- practical. Uh, uh, issues and and like like here eddie stayed up too long doing too many things and making too many trips and now he's exhausted and he didn't get enough sleep and now he's gonna pass out and like it's 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 very it's very mundane really um yeah and and king really just gets every single molecule of of tension out of it that he can Yeah, and I think it's relatable, too. Like, we got these people on an alien world (laughs) um, surrounded by lobster monsters. Um, And what is the conflict? It's it's Eddie trying real hard to stay awake. And I know, like, when I have a lot going on and I'm busy trying to get everything done, I've had moments where I'm just, like, 
like if I'm if we're if book club's coming up and I haven't finished the book yet, Matt, and it's like two in the morning and I'm like, I got to get to page 500 before today to keep on my schedule to get the book done in time. And I just can't fucking stay awake. I'm just staring at the page and I'll just nod off and you can't stop it. Like, I think everyone's had moments like that where, like, they want nothing more in the world than to stay awake and it's just not happening. Um, and so you're in this foreign world with this these foreign adversaries and this weird magic doors. But the problem, you can grasp and hold on to it and relate to it. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you put me in a college lecture hall and I will immediately fall asleep no matter what is happening. So God, I, you know, I, I did not used to fall asleep during classes very often, but there was a couple classes that no matter what, man, I just get real tired in that class. Yeah. I, uh, you know, what's funny is I thought I was over this. And then recently, just in the last couple of weeks or so, I had a college professor give a lecture and I, and I was like literally passing out and I was like, Oh, I get it. It's just lectures. <laughs> it's just so comfy in there. It's, 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 so it's comfy. dark and comfy and yeah. Yeah. Cool. So I, I, I keep bringing up the idea of, of the way in which Detta is describing Eddie as young, uh, intentionally, because I think something is going on here. And I think what we're seeing here is that Detta and Odetta are starting to blur a little bit. We've we had these moments in the la- in last week's reading where Odetta continually saw how young and, and childish and kind of kiddish um, Eddie was. And we kind of noted how that was a little interesting. But then we see here that Detta is kind of doing the same thing. And then I think to, to, to support this idea that their personalities are starting to blur a little bit, we have Detta ask her this fairly simple question that pokes a big giant hole in her narrative. If they were scared, you might die. Why'd they try to get you to eat poison in the first place? The question scared her the way that m- the momentary feeling of pity had scared her. She wasn't used to questioning herself. And furthermore, that questioning voice in her mind didn't seem like her voice at all. Yeah, I mean, the border between the two is starting to come down, yeah. um, which which is a, a motif which will continue uh, until the end. Yeah. And, and, pre- and it was starting to prepare us for how things are going to evolve toward the end. Yeah, and I love that King hints towards that via um, this idea, like the the building blocks for that is, man, he looks so young. He looks so young. And I was like, well, that's an Odetta thing. That's not a Detta thing. And they're like, oh, wait a minute. Mm-hmm. It is. They're just that those walls are starting to come down. Yeah, it's that, that that's really cool. And it's it's subtle. I, like, I think you can I think I even the first time I, I went through this section, I was like, it, it just um. I don't think I made anything of it. I don't think it was, I don't think it stuck out to me particularly. It wasn't until later that I, that like, uh, we'll, we'll get to the moment in a minute, but the moment where she decides not to just kill Eddie, mm-hmm. um, that was when I was like, Oh, I get it. Like she's, she's, it, it's starting to leak through. So. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So Detta crawls down to a sleeping Eddie and decides that tying him up is the best course of action. And she's, and as she's doing so, she happens to take a look into the door, the open door standing there, and sees Roland inside Jack Mort holding up a drugstore. King gives us a little uh, sneak preview of the next chapter here. I like it because we don't know exactly what happened to lead to this seemingly crazy moment <laughs> inside Jack Mort's head, but because we know what Roland needs and how he's going to go about getting it. We can just connect those dots before the book has actually connected them for us. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fun. Um, I don't want to completely derail the podcast at this point, but it is, I, I am confused that um, he turned around when he was in Jack Mort's office and he saw her uh, in front of the door and here she is seemingly going down to the door for the first time. And he's already at the, um, the drugstore scene, which is much later. And I'm just like, what am I misunderstanding about the timeline? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't have a clear answer for you. You asked me about this before we started recording and I was just like, Oh, um, I, I think, I think the, so first of all, like hours have gone by before she even goes down there, right? which is why he's in the office. Um, I think there is as data, like makes her plan and starts moving stuff around and like figuring out what she wants to do. Um, I think time does go by before she looks into the door. That's okay. the only thing I can say. And it's just maybe not as clear as it needs to be. So so he saw her before she bothered to look into the door and actually Correct. Yeah, okay. That Correct, that, that, yeah. that that can that could work. I think that Because I, I think know. she does come down and get close and like study Eddie for a bit and kind of lay out her plan before she starts executing it. And it's not until she really starts executing the plan that she happens to look into the door. Okay. I think. Okay. Yeah. yeah. 
but yeah no it's it's great dramatic irony um because or or what well, yeah whatever this is that she that we're like drugstore what the hell yeah. is that <laughs> um and and that's i i do like that these two stories are sort of playing off of each other uh through the door as you know one character will look through the, through the door and we'll see something and not understand the context of it and then that right. pulls us to the next thing yeah yeah for sure for sure um so Detta executes her plan by tying a noose around Eddie's head, which I think is uh, definitely some more intentional imagery here, Matt. We've had Detta is is very much, you know, playing in um, like the typical kind of stereotyping of of black people and black women specifically. And so using a noose on Eddie here, I think, is intentional. I think we're, we're using that kind of very charged imagery on purpose. Um, I, yeah, no, I think you're right. I, that honestly didn't catch my attention, but I think that's absolutely right. Yeah. So she drags him down to the beach and leaves him tied up right next to the water. This is, I think, just kind of confirming through this chapter what Roland had already kind of like guessed in his, which is that uh, they're in a race against time. The sunset is going to come and the lobstrosities will come and that's our time limit that's like everything has to be done before the sun sets or eddie is dead yeah yeah that she definitely leaves everybody in a pickle um yeah. but uh yeah like i said a second ago i want to point out that her first plan is to murder him with a rock and then just sort of set up his body so that he doesn't look dead so that she can trick roland mm-hmm. and then her inner odetta voice gives her pause and basically persuades her to do this plan instead so she's already yeah. at the point of compromising the kind of like straightforward murderousness of of typical data. Yeah, and and I I wonder why this is happening because like I guess it's just literally the sneak peek they got at each other back when Roland first drew her um just ripped a hole in this wall between them and the 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 structural integrity of that wall has been compromised now and stuff is leaking through more and more as it goes along. I mean, at the end of this chapter, we have them finally face each other. Um, and, and then Susanna is born, but what would have, I mean, like would that wall have continued to collapse without that intervention? I don't think she would have gotten to this, like the, I am a whole new person. I am a combination Susanna Dean without Roland's intervention, but I think we would have probably seen the wall between them continue to crumple more and more. Yeah, I mean, there was the the placental tearing, which I see as being the moment where the the the, the breach was made. Yeah, um, and I'm glad we've gotten to say the phrase placental tearing um, every every episode of this podcast. It's, it's really a, it's really a, great. It's a good phrase. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, and um, like when Roland spoke to Odetta while Detta was active, that seemed like another important moment where Odetta like where, where Detta really wanted to be in denial of what was happening, but like it was really hard to hard to paper over this idea of like he's yeah. talking to someone inside me right now, um, and just the cognitive dis- the, the cognitive dissonance is kind of uh, unable to support itself anymore. I mean, I think I think that uh, I think that the the, uh, the the barrier would have continued to erode, but I think there there was a risk that maybe Detta could have won in the end. Whereas it seems like um, the way things fall out in the story for various reasons. Odetta doesn't win, you know, Odetta doesn't win either. There's a kind of synthesis. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that's the only way Susanna could have been born. It was via that way. I think the wall would have continued to fall down and they might have been more aware of each other, but it would still have been a contentious war between these two personalities rather than what we see at the end of this book. I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Speaking of Roland talking to Odetta through Detta, I I think like, and this is not textual but this is my conclusion on this because eddie is tied up in the sand and he's trying to stop detta and he goes listen odetta and it doesn't work at all Uh and i really do think he's trying to do the same thing roland was trying to do that you just talked about is he's he's trying to do like the because that's how roland did it too he did listen odetta and like got to odetta within detta i really think that's what eddie's trying here and it just doesn't work <laughs> yeah. yeah she just hates the name i i think it's she demands not only that he say detta but that he say her whole name detta walker like almost mm-hmm. like it's an incantation re- reaffirming her existence yeah and yeah i mean whatever whatever pow- power roland had i don't think eddie has it and and furthermore 
I think now Detta is so on edge and so like sensitive to this idea that that he's that that she just wants to deny this as fiercely as she can. Yeah, so. yeah, I think you're right there. I, I <laughs> yeah, I mean, we Eddie is a gunslinger. Roland says, um, but we don't know he's not a gunslinger yet. You know, so maybe this is a power only active to gunslingers. Maybe this is a power only active to Roland and and his line. Um, we don't really know, but yeah, whatever it is, Eddie. And he can't channel that same thing yeah. <laughs> successfully. I really like that. Yeah, me too. It's a lot of fun. All right. So that is the end of chapter two, the honeypot. Um, the honeypot in this case is Eddie. Eddie is the honeypot for the for the lobstrosities. Mm-hmm. Um, and we move on to chapter three. Roland takes his medicine. And before we begin here, there's, there's a bit of wordplay and some reference that King, I think King is doing here. I'm sure you're aware, Matt, of the taking your medicine phrase, right? As just a term that basically means accept the punishment that's coming towards you, right? Sure. Um, which is an interesting lens to look at this chapter from, from not only is Roland literally taking the medicine he needs to survive, but also um, being punished in some way, possibly. But on top of that, it's also a reference to the shining in which the protagonist jack torrance like that was his phrase you know we were talking about the ticks roland gives his characters one of jack torrance's ticks is the use of this phrase take your medicine um it's what he says to both his wife and his son um as he is driven insane by the hotel um that's all everyone knows the shining right like even if you haven't read the book you know the story of the shining yes i think everyone in the world does Yes. So, but that is, I think that is specific. I don't, I don't remember if that's in Kubrick's movie or not, but I know it is in the book. So in my opinion, he's channeling some fun little reference there with this phrase. Uh, yeah, that's cool. I didn't think of it as a reference. Um, what I was more noticing was the idea that, uh, the, the first chapter of this, you know, this week's reading is bitter, bitter medicine. The second is the honey pot. Um, and then this, this is Roland takes his medicine. So we've got these like signals of like sweetness and bitterness and and medicine and um i don't know i don't know what to say about it uh, other than it's 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 interesting that you know bitterness and sweetness are contrasted right yeah that is true like i'm trying to think of what bitter medicine means in the context of that first chapter like what is the bitter medicine of that chapter um is it roland um recognizing like realizing who jack mort is and like i think so the horror of that situation i think i think it has to be the 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 idea that um he he went for his medicine right like that's why that's why he went through the door he's like i'm making my medicine and what he finds is maybe a different kind of medicine than he expected like a spiritual medicine of like oh my god this is so horrifying that yeah that it's almost like an enema (laughs) of jack mort is a spiritual enema for roland and he and he, he rejects him um i mean that's basically yeah. the, the ending of this is he he rejects this guy he's like nope mm-hmm. nope i'm gonna be the third <laughs> you get out of here right right and i want like you know we had in the last section all this talk about roland and his fear about his inability to love and what a person who was unable to love would look like if they reached the tower um and part of me is like well maybe they would look a little bit like jack mort mm-hmm. and that is roland recognizing that taking his medicine being punished through seeing that. And I think at the end of this book, Roland like at like one of the last lines in this book is just because I'm damned doesn't mean I can't love. Um, and I think that's such a powerful phrase and we'll get to it when we get there. But I I wonder if that has something to do with this, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I think you're right. Cool. Um, all right. So we open the chapter with Roland thinking about just how much Jack Mort sucks And therefore, how he has no qualms with just taking over his body and ignoring the screams and protests of the man as he walks out of the accounting office. Um, Eventually, Mort just passes out in shock, which Roland enjoys. (laughs) Yeah, I think we enjoy this, too. Um, And I'm really going to enjoy how Roland just treats this guy like garbage because he deserves it. And it's great. And I'm going to continue to talk about how great that is throughout the rest of this conversation. Yeah, totally agree. And and the rest of this chapter, as it unfolds, is kind of like this part hilarious, part incredibly dark fish out of water story as Roland bumbles his way into getting ammunition and then eventually the medicine he needs. His plans are always good, but they often go awry as as Roland isn't entirely up to how things work in our world. This is really the first time we've gotten to see this, Matt. You didn't get that thing you've been talking about since we started this book that Roland goes to our world moment you didn't get that not exactly but this is the this is the first time he's been really quote-unquote alone 
in our world. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, we kind of see the ways in which that, that is making his life difficult. He does have one thing, though. He has his Mort Psychopedia to guide him. I think this is so fun and probably one of my favorite parts of the book. Like, like uh, the, th- the great thing about Jack Mort is King has successfully made it so you just don't care about the guy. And so you can just enjoy Body Snatcher Roland trying to, like, talk to shop owners. <laughs> Um, uh-huh. without having to think about the moral or uh, like and and horrifying implications of seizing someone's body and and piloting it towards your own needs because you're like yeah i mean normally that would be bad but jack mort <laughs> right it's so fun like i have to yeah. wonder if this wasn't one of the main scenes that king wanted to write walking into this book because mm-hmm. i mean the idea of body snatching is fun it's not you know king didn't invent it for this book but it, it's it's a it's a neat idea to play with um and it's a it's furthermore a neat twist on that idea to have like a decent but ruthless guy body snatching a guy who sucks really bad yeah and then systematically ruining that guy's life and then killing him (laughs) in a a really you know awful way like sure like that's that's a twist because usually the person who's getting body snatched is like a victim and, and, and it's bad in this case, you're like, oh, this is a good thing to happen to this character. He deserves every every part of this. So yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, it's it's just it's just such a it's such a great time. It really is such a great time. Um, the other result of it though is that Roland, because his only reference point to this world is the Mortsipedia, he gets a very skewed view of the world because he's getting opinions and a view of our world from the perspective of a total monster. Um, And this combined with his kind of biased view of the people of our world, like he calls basically everyone fat. Everyone is doughy, which like, I don't even know how like overweight these people are. They're probably like just normal Americans. (laughs) And then it's just Roland lives in this world where everyone's tough or dead. And so to, to him, everyone everyone looks look a little a little heavy um but but the result is you get roland like inadvertently being offensive as hell to everyone because he's repeating uh like slurs and like racist things that he doesn't understand Mm -hmm. but it's all coming from mort so it's terrible which is like it's funny It, it is a funny way of like saying like king is is in no way saying the way that Roland is referring to these people is a good thing <laughs> at all. Um, but, but because it's coming from Mort, it's just this really dark, awful perspective on the world. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, it, it's, it's darkly funny though. Like I, I do think mm-hmm. it's funny, like despite the fact that he's being awful, I think it's successfully humorous. Yeah. Had the, the fish out of water stuff. Um, in fact, I think overall, if you asked me at the start of this book, especially after coming off of the gunslinger. I don't think I would have predicted how funny this book was going to be yeah. uh, with, with all the fish out of water stuff, including this. Yeah. And I think maybe you understand what I meant when we finished the gunslinger about how different um, that book is. I, I think you will find that the rest of the books are much closer in line to this type of storytelling, to this type of tone than they were to that one. Yeah. Um, so maybe you get it a little bit more now. Yeah. I mean, you're basically, as long as we're putting in, putting Roland in these interesting situations where he's not really the best fit for the situation. It's not, it's not something where he can just shoot a bunch of people and get out of it. Um, mm-hmm. That's, that's going to be way more fun. Like, I think that was like, it wasn't a problem with the gunslinger, but like, he he shoots a bunch of people he shoots a bunch of uh, slow zombies and he, and there's a lot of there's a lot of kind of him dealing with problems in the way that Roland is good at dealing with problems and yeah. in this book like nothing is ever a problem that's set up for Roland to be able to solve it conveniently every sure. everything is a complicated situation where he doesn't really understand what's going on and he has to either be clever or or just kind of like humorously blunt in a way that's fun. Sure, sure. And I, and I will say Roland will solve problems by shooting a bunch of people in the future. That is definitely still going to happen. But I, I take your meaning. And it will be in more clever, fun, interesting ways than it was in The Gunslinger. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I mean, he definitely shot a bunch of people to get Eddie free. So there's, yes, there's, yes. Been, there's been some shooting. There will be more shooting. Okay. Don't you worry. Uh, speaking of shooting, to do all that, we need ammo. And so Roland... <laughs> heads to a gun store and is shocked, absolutely shocked to learn how available and prevalent ammunition ammunition is in this world. 50 round boxes of 
45 shells for less than 20 bucks each. It's incredible to him. He's flabbergasted. And I wish I could say this as like a, this is Stephen King commenting on like the prevalence of gun stuff in the United States, which it could be. It could be. I don't Uh know. Unfortunately, Roland needs a valid handgun permit to buy the ammunition, and little Jackie Mort just likes pushing people, not shooting them, which is really bad luck because, like, New York City, that is def- that was definitely a law then and is a law now. I-, I was curious and I checked to buy ammunition in New York City, or New York State, rather. Um, you need a, a, a gu- handgun license. Um, rifle ammunition, you can buy all that you want, but handgun, <laughs> you, need, you need a license. Makes sense. Um, <laughs> Texas, where I live... Not the case. Uh-huh. <laughs> you do not even need to see any form of identification. You can just he could just come in and bought like a truckload. No one would have said anything. Yep, yep. Uh, I can verify that. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, and this all implies, of course, that whatever force guides the doors was more interested in Roland getting this chance to get justice for Odetta or or you know whatever else to be faced with this character than it is with him getting you know his bullets or his medicine or any of these extraneous things that he happens to need to live yeah because I mean like why New York City right like didn't need to be New York City um but it is every single one of these and it's it's different years some decades apart but it's always New York City yeah, that seems important. That seems mm-hmm. relevant. Like, like, like New York City is some kind of hub, uh, mm-hmm. you know, universally or spiritually or something. And sure. because I mean, it, uh, I I don't know. It, it's it, it's it's within decades, but it's not like within hundreds of years. He's right. It's not other. It, and it's always our world, right? It's never mm-hmm. like we get this idea that this is a multiverse. I'm 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 making some assumptions, but I feel like. This is a multiverse of some kind. And yet we're always going to this one specific sort of era of this one specific city of this one specific world. So, yeah, definitely yeah. seems important. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, and I think the the connection between uh, Odetta, Jack and Jake, I think, helps make that clear. Right. That this are, these are not different instances of New York City and different universes, that this is the one New York City, uh, our New York City, thanks to our shining references, <laughs> um, that they are going to. Yeah, I, that's that was my assumption as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, so Roland now has to come up with a plan here because he doesn't have the the, identi- the identification and the card he needs. So he comes up with a, a great, clever plan. He drops Jack Mort's wallet on the ground and kind of pushes it under the gun case. The book uh, calls this him setting his own honeypot. And I like that, once again, the text is drawing a connection back to Detta Walker, back to this difficult, like, the, the dark, bad side of Odetta. And now we're once again connecting her to Roland. Um, it's not the same, but that line is still drawn. Yeah, it reminds us of that lurking tension in the background. And uh, also it emphasizes his similarity to Detta because they're both setting honeypots. They, 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 think, in ter- they think in similar terms. They think in terms right. of traps and, yeah. and strategy and outflanking people. It, it reminds me of, you know, be, being in Detta's head and thinking and in the text saying Roland would have understood. And, um, uh, you know, them, them having for all of her, you know, violence, like, well, he's a violent guy, too. So, yeah, no, I, yeah, I, I totally forgot about the Roland would have understood line. That's great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Roland walks out of the store and he goes and gets a couple of cops. When he pulled up to the gun store, he saw these two cops waiting outside. Their names are Car- Carl Delavan and George O'Meara. Um, and they turn out to kind of suck. <laughs> they're uh-huh. like they're like shitty people. Um, but he he goes in there and convinces them that the shop owner has stolen his wallet or rather Jack Mort's wallet. And because they think that the store sells guns illegally, they uh, agree to kind of they, they like believe him right away and, and look at this as an excuse to bust this guy they've been trying to bust for a while. Mm-hmm. But there's this really great moment, I think, w- through them, we kind of jump into their perspective um, and we see what Roland really looks like to people around them. And I I love the section. It's long. I want to read it all because it's amazing, though. Please do. There was something about this guy. Omira couldn't put his finger on it, but remembering later on when there weren't so many other things to think about, the chief of which 
of course, was the simple fact that the gold detective's badge didn't matter. It turned out that just holding on to jobs they had would be pure brassy-ass miracle. But years later, there was a brief moment of epiphany when O'Meara took his two sons to the Museum of Science in Boston. They had a machine there, a computer, that played tic-tac-toe. And unless you put your X in the middle square on your first move, the machine fucked you over every time. But there was always a pause as it checked its memory for all possible gambits. He and his boys had been fascinated, but there was something spooky about it. And then he remembered Blue Suit. He remembered because Blue Suit had had, some, had the same fucking habit. Talking to him had been like talking to a robot. And then it goes on, Delavan, the other cop, had no such feeling, but nine years later, when he took his own son, then 18 and about to start college, to the movies one night, Delavan would rise unexpectedly to his feet about 30 minutes into the feature and scream, it's him, that's him, that's the guy in the fucking blue suit, the guy who was at Cliff. Somebody would shout down in front, but needn't have bothered. Delavan, 70 pounds overweight and a heavy smoker, would be struck by a fatal heart attack before the complainer even got to the second word. The man in the blue suit who approached their cruiser that day and told them about his stolen wa- wallet didn't look like the star of the movie, but the dead delivery of words had been the same. So had been the somehow relentless yet graceful way he moved. That movie, of course, had been The Terminator. <laughs> uh, not much to say other than this is delightful. Um, the idea that Roland is so badass that he, the fear of him killed this man many years distant. Um, yeah. And I never get sick of these pop culture digressions that make Roland seem more awesome. Yeah. And I mean, it's just like, like we, we're seeing him go into the Mort Sapedia, like from his perspective, but I love that King allows us to see this, how goofy this looks from other people's perspective. Like, it's like every phrase, there's like this awkward pause and then he replies and we get to see like, and I think connecting it to the Terminator like and to robots in general like give us the reader a clear understanding of what that looks like yeah it also makes me play that like industrial soundtrack that plays whenever the terminator is walking around yeah um and and like turning his head slowly uh just whenever i'm visualizing roland yeah that's exactly it's just that's roland yeah Arnold Schwarzenegger. it's also a nice way of saying you know roland moves and speaks like arnold schwarzenegger's the terminator character yeah yeah uh, without actually quite saying it yeah yeah he, I mean, without the accent, but yes. Right. So the two cops go to confront Fat Johnny, which is the name of the guy behind the catch register. Everybody has nicknames in this <laughs> world, Matt. Everybody. Uh-huh. Um, and we're waiting for Roland's great, brilliant plan to evolve in a way where he manages to get out of this with the ammunition he wants. And his plan is just like he just grabs them by the face and smashes their heads together mm-hmm. <laughs> and then just grabs the gun and holds up the guy and says, give me the bullets. Yep. (laughs) That's his plan. It's, it's so fun. It's so funny. I love it. It's, it's so funny because like, I think there's a second there when you're just like, wait, what? Well, why do you even involve the cops? Yeah. How is this supposed to? Yeah. Well, and, and you realize the reason why he involved the cops is because like, if he held up the guy while the cops were still outside and then like rushed out of the door with all the bullets, the guy would just run out after him and say, hey, that guy stole my shit. And also he's so, using the gu- the cop's guns to do this, right? Well, I think he takes, I think he takes uh, um, um, Fat Johnny's gun. He doesn't take their guns until they're after, after they're knocked out. So, but, but the reason he's able to take Fat, jo- Fat Johnny's gun is because the cops. The cops took it, yes. Took, yes, took it yeah. away. So, yeah. So, I mean, it all, it, it works out. How much of this exactly was planned out is left up in the air. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the things that it does, the book does really well is like define Roland as the improviser, right? Mm-hmm. That he, this is what he does. He makes plans, but then he improvises off of them. And it, it draws a nice, nice comparison to Jack Mort, who is in his doobie way is just plan out perfectly. No improvisation needed. That's where you get in trouble. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know. I love it. I love it. It's so funny. It I did, like, just yeah. like you're reading, you're like, oh, you just. You just hit their heads together. Yeah, this like because you think you think as he's thinking about it, but not telling you what the plan is that it's going to be this complex con, and it's just crack their heads together and steal. Yep. yep. And I don't know why the way King writes it is makes it even more funnier to me. It's he didn't just write and then he cracked their heads together. 
It's written, Roland took one final step forward. He cupped Delavan's right <laughs> cheek in one hand, Omira's left cheek in the other, and all of a sudden, a day Fat Johnny had believed to have hit rock bottom got a lot worse. The spook in the blue suit brought the cops' heads together hard enough to make a sound like rocks wrapped in felt conditioning with each other. <laughs> Just like the idea that like he cups their cheeks in their hands, and you can almost like wonder what's going through the, <laughs> these these cops' heads in the fraction of a second before their heads get smashed together. Together as someone like <laughs> grabs them by the cheeks i don't know it just makes uh-huh. it so much funnier to me yeah right this is a i mean it, it is cool I, I do want to talk about the pros because we read a lot of different books by a lot of different authors and mm-hmm. i think king is way way on this side of whatever this axis is where the opposite side of the axis is roland um uh crack their heads together mm-hmm that's how you write that. And then, but, but King writes it as the detail cupping the, the left cheek with the right hand, cupping the, the, the right cheek and, and, or, you know, uh, the, the describing fat Johnny Holden's reaction to this, the sound of rocks wrapped in felt colliding. Um, <laughs> the, you know, the guy in, in gold rimmed specs stood like every, everything is physical and visual and yeah. auditory and, people's reactions and like and then the, you know the 357 mag point was pointed at fat johnny the detail that the, the proper names for things yeah the the muzzle looked big enough to hold a moon rocket like it, yeah. it's all no no sentence is <laughs> is is, sh- is short and and efficient when it could be complex and fun <laughs> yeah and and descriptive and 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 Im- like not important but like it every sentence carries emotion and tone yeah. behind it. Like every, every sentence is doing work to establish a feeling of a scene. It's really hard to prep for this, Matt. And our scripts are really long because I just want to pull everything. Like just like, I think one thing that gets lost in the analysis sometimes is just how fun it is just to read the words on the page. Like just like taking outside, like searching for deeper meaning and thematic resonance and what we think the author is trying to do and why it works. But just like, just reading the words, the the words that are being picked here are great. <laughs> yeah. And I just always enjoy that. I always enjoy that with King. Like every Every one of his books is infused with this kind of stuff. And that's why I don't mind when he goes on these random long diversions that don't really go anywhere because it's so infused with style throughout. Yeah, I agree. You know, uh, there's another podcast on our network called Do the Right Thing where you you write a 30 minute short story. And I've been meaning for some time and I think I'm going to commit to it this week to write one that's just my, my whole my sole goal with it is write something in the style of Stephen King with, with all of this detail and like luscious, luscious excessive detail, because it's not really the way I usually write. And I think mm-hmm. it would be fun to do. I think it might give me some insight into um, some, just some kind of insight that I might be able to use for this, this for, for these discussions. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that yeah. this week. That sounds awesome. I can't wait to read that. Let me know when you're done. Okay, cool. Um, right. Yeah. It's, it, but this is fun. Yeah. yeah. That was a great little, uh, we took our own little diversion to talk about King's diversion. We did. I really love this moment though, Matt, where Roland straps the cop's belt onto himself and there's this, he feels whole again. He might be in a different body. They might be the wrong kinds of guns, but he feels like himself again. In fact, he somehow channels so much energy out of this that when fat Johnny looks up at him and sees him, he almost doesn't recognize him. He looks so dramatically different. Just and the detail of like, this should have looked really stupid. Like he's got these, he's got these belts wrapped around him and he's wearing a suit jacket and it should look really stupid. It shouldn't work at all. But Johnny's like, Oh, but it does. Yeah. Right. Probably helps that he's got his bombardier's eyes on. Yeah, of course. Of course. Um, he also says in this moment, as he picks up the cop guns, he says two guns, one for Eddie and one for Odetta when, and if Odetta was ready for a gun. I I love this because like, not only is Roland starting to think ahead, he's starting to think of what's going to happen next. And, and he's got these two gunslingers on his side now. Um, and of course they should both get a gun, but I think it also implies sadly to me that Roland thinks he's going to keep both of his father's guns, even though, 
he can only use one of them now. And I don't know if this is Roland having just like he's been in this body for a little bit of time and he's forgotten that he doesn't have a working hand anymore or something. But either way, it made me sad. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I that's interesting. I think, I mean, he is borderline religious about his guns. Yeah. And yeah. um, I sort of at this point felt like he would just keep carrying two guns even if he couldn't use them both. I wrote That's this fair. in the script, and then I realized at the end of this book, he, it actually says he's only carrying one gun now. Mm-hmm. Um, so that feeling was incorrect. <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure where his other gun went i guess that's a question we'll find out about yeah later. well i mean he loses these two guns right like he that's does not true. bring these two guns over because he's stripped down naked by the end of it so i'm sure Susanna or eddie has one of the other ones i think you're right but. um in the middle of all this though king briefly cuts back to eddie and detta on the other side of the door eddie is still tied up still waiting this part isn't necessary per se nothing advances here but i think king uses it to remind us of our time crunch showing us the package passage of time it also serves to give us like this really interesting cut back to roland where like suddenly in the middle of this whole thing going down roland is imagining eddie being killed by the lobsters as detta like laughs in the background um and that's like like roland's worst fear coming true also interestingly here matt King describes Detta as the really bad woman, which matches the really bad man that Detta had called Roland earlier. It's the only time in the book that does this. The the phrase really bad woman is used. I looked because I was curious. It's the only time. And it really jumps out at you here because of that past connotation. Why why do you think King chose to use that here? So um there's kind of a there's kind of two ways that, that I see this. One is that um this is maybe more than just imagining. Maybe it's more like a vision. And in, in this vision, he's maybe having some special insight into Detta and Detta's, Detta's plans, Detta's thoughts, maybe some like psychic glimpse into Detta's plans and imaginings. Um, the other way of thinking about it is that I think King just is painting with words. And it's not like he's... Th- th- that first thing I said, that first explanation is very like literalistic and mechanistic and down to mm-hmm. like, well, this is this is what's happening in the world and this is why exactly this would happen. And it's like sometimes I think King just wants to create a feeling in you and so he does so. And it doesn't really have like a a Watsonian justification. It's more of a doyalistic, um, I'm going to make them feel scared for a second that uh that that eddie is getting eaten by lobstrosities yeah yeah and and that's most that's most of the reason why that's in there i think you're right and i think it also serves to kind of reverse the power dynamic in this vision detta has become the one in charge detta has become the 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 kidnapper um and therefore roland is in the position that detta was in before and therefore his view of her is mirroring her view of him Mm mm-hmm that's yeah that's, i like that yeah For i sure. like it i i totally agree with the the painting with words that is that is our our author here 100 mm-hmm. percent. Mm-hmm. so roland sachets down 49th street as he heads for the drugstore that that johnny pointed out to him i i want to stop and talk to you about the, the way king describes this drugstore matt because it's so great <laughs> He had anticipated a dim candlelit room full of bittered fumes, jars of unknown powders and liquids and filters, many covered with a layer of dust or spun about with a century's cobwebs. He had expected a man in a cowl, a man who might be dangerous. He saw people moving about inside through a transparent plate glass windows and as casually as they would at Eddie's shop and believed they must be an illusion. They weren't. So for a moment, the gunslinger merely stood inside the door, first amazed, then ironically amused. Here he was, in a world which struck him dumb, with fresh wonders seemingly at every step. A world where carriages flew through the air, and paper seemed as cheap as sand. And the newest wonder was simply that that for these people, wonder had run out. Here, in a place of miracles, he saw only dull faces and plodding bodies. There were thousands of bottles, there were potions, there were filters, but the Mortsipedia identified most as quack remedies. Here was a salve that was supposed to restore fallen hair, 
but would not. There, a cream which promised to erase unsightly spots on the hands and arms, but lied. Here were cures for things that needed no curing, things that made your bowels run or stop them up, to make your teeth white and your hair black, things to make your breath smell better as if you could not do that by chewing alder bark. No magic here, only trivialities. Although there was Aston and a few other remedies which sounded as if they might be useful. But for the most part, Roland was appalled by this place, in a place that promised alchemy but dealt more in perfume than potion. Was it any wonder that wonder had run out? I'm sorry that was long and I read it all, but I had to because it's incredible. Yeah, there's just too much good writing. I I, I don't mind the reading because it's fun. it's fun to be reminded of like to get swept up in it you know it yeah. just, just as you're reading it i'm like reliving it i'm swept up mm-hmm. in it again yeah um i'm gonna start uh somewhat belatedly referring to these as roland's stand-up bits <laughs> where he just kind of shakes his head and sternly judges us for our modern foolishness and 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 kind of riffs on like because really i mean really what this is is it's king being like aren't we ridiculous yeah yeah um but but I mean it's it it's also totally consistent that Roland would be having this reaction and yeah and um and it's it's just delightful to to to, to observe and be like yeah you're right we are ridiculous yeah oh well what was, are we gonna do I love that last sentence was it any wonder that wonder had run out that's just perfect and and also um I I don't want to be like yeah it's just it's all just a joke it's just a joke because I don't think it's just a joke he's yeah, we've got many many beats in this book where um. The story, the the text is is sort of criticizing America or or New York, or, if, if you will, like the materialism, the yeah. hollowness, the emptiness, the 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 isolation, the fact that everyone is miserable and sort of like um, floundering and addicted yeah. to things or running from things, and uh, you know using these these snake oil. Uh, uh, solutions for problems that don't even exist. Sure. Um, the, the, you know, the professional smile of Jake's father, even yeah. it, it's all, it's all this web of just like New York city being kind of almost this, this web of, um, of emptiness. And I think that's, that's not just like Stephen King being goth. I think that's the theme of, it's one of the themes of the story. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. And I think to confirm that, we meet Katz, the pharmacist, a 46-year-old man that looks 20 years older than that. He's miserable. He's unhappy in his profession. We learn that he only got into this because it's like his dad made him. He said, the only thing I'm going to pay for in school is pharmacy. And so that's what he did. He's wearing dentures already, Matt. He's a 46-year-old man wearing dentures. Um, and, and we see him arguing with a pill addict on the phone. And and this is exactly what I wanted to use the scene to talk to you about. Like The people of, of our world that King depicts are fat. They're slow, they're miserable, they're lacking in wonder. Every character we've met in this book is unhappy, aren't they? Every single one. Like both Johnny and Katz here, these two characters, talk about how they thought this day was their rock bottom before Roland shows up and fucks their day up. Um, And so it's just, I think you're totally right that, that he is depicting this world in a very certain way. And I wonder, like, what is the goal in that? What is the goal in saying, like part of me wants to get metatextual to it and say, look at Roland coming into this world and pulling these people into our worlds, like drawing characters into story and in story promises danger and possible death, but adventure and things you're going to see and wonder again. It's, it, it brings wonder to these people's lives again and makes them whole in certain ways. And I, I find that concept really really fascinating because king on top of being a writer is just like generally a lover of story like even if he wasn't writing them he would be reading them he read the dude like writes like crazy and still has time to read 80 books a year which is just insane to me i read a lot and i don't read 80 books a year Mm -hmm. so like he just loves story and he loves the power of story and i really do think this is kind of his examination of of what story can do is take people out of their dull plotting miserable lives and give them wonder Mm -hmm. yeah um that that is very metatextual and that's a fantastic lens through which to see this because Roland says a lot of these things like yeah i mean it's going to be dangerous but we you know w- it'll be magnificent or mm-hmm. I, I, is that i'm not not sure if that's the word he uses i think he does use that word yeah yeah like we we will be magnificent is what he says and it's mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's this, this idea that he you know he took 
it took these two people who were struggling and uh, I mean, Eddie was probably not even going to live long uh, if we're being honest. Yeah. And he, 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 you know, he said, Eddie says, you saved my soul at the end. Um, even, even if Eddie ends up dying, he will still feel like Roland saved his soul by bringing him into this, this adventure. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. that's, uh, I mean, yeah, I'm going to have to process this metatextual uh, lens that you've just handed me. Um, cool. so maybe yeah. we'll talk more about that, uh, as we go forward. Absolutely. I think, I think that's safe to say. So when Katz finishes his call with this pilatic woman, he finds Roland Mort standing in front of him, holding, holding the place up for penicillin. <laughs> uh-huh. Yep. Um, among the more hilarious audiobook readings was, uh, I did not say cocaine. I said Keflex. That's what I thought you said. <laughs> <laughs> it's so hilarious, right? Like, I love that, like, through cats, we see just, like, the insanity of this, um, <laughs> of this, this request. And, like, we didn't mention it before, but when he bought the bullets, he paid for the bullets. Uh-huh. <laughs> and when he buys, the, he pays for the, ca- like, he's holding it up. He doesn't have a prescription, but he still pays for it. And here he pays for it with a $6,500 watch yeah, <laughs> that belongs to Jack Mort. Um, <laughs> it's really funny because like, he's not interested in stealing. He just doesn't have time to go through the proper channels. Um, it's really great. I like it a lot, but he gets 200 Keflex, which is about $60 worth of drug and pays for it with a really expensive Rolex. Um, and, and I want to point out here that like, there is this moment where he once again, Roland proves how badass he is because he catches like a couple people trying to be heroes in the curved mirror that allows him to see behind them and do cool shit. And I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. You know, and he, he's not only does he like not want to steal, but he, he stops them in this very cool fashion because he's really not trying to hurt anybody. Um, you know, he, he may be the Terminator, but he's not mowing down innocence like the Terminator would. He's going, sure. he, he's going to accomplish his mission, but he's going to accomplish it with relatively minimized collateral damage. Like yeah. he, he shoots things out of people's hands and then they just run. Um, and then he's even genuinely outraged when, uh, you know, the cops come in with guns blazing shortly. Oh, I love that. I love that. Uh, that his outrage there in the next chapter is really wonderful. So yeah. let's let's get right into it. Um, let's Please. move on to chapter four, the drawing. We begin the final chapter of the book back on our two knocked out cops as they wake up, assess the situation and head out after Roland. They almost immediately catch up to him, which I was a little su- surprised about. Like, it's just they hop in their car and drive right down the street. And there's the pharmacy. And Roland is happening to be like running out of the pharmacy at the same time they roll up. Um but they he runs back inside and they immediately open fire on him with their they they don't have their guns left because Roland took that but they do have their shotgun and they just like shoot a shotgun into this crowded pharmacy and as you said Roland is not just mad he is furious because he's one thing we haven't said is he's calling these guys gunslingers right like mm-hmm. they are the gunslingers of our world that's what he assesses them at that's what he looks them at and and here, when they fire the shotgun into the, the pharmacy, he's like, they can't know if there are still innocent people are here or not, he thought. They can't know, and yet they use a scatter rifle just the same. It was unforgivable. He felt anger and suppressed it. They were gunslingers. Better to believe their brains had been addled by the head knocking they'd taken than to believe they'd done such a thing knowingly without a care for whom they might hurt or kill. And I love this. Like, it really doing work to... to, to like remind us of Roland's sense of warrior code here, right? The killing of innocence, no worse. The idea of having enough re- disregard about the situation that you might kill innocence is an unforgivable offense to Roland. The same guy who let a kid die <laughs> to achieve his quest. Yeah, well, I mean, it's one thing to be bad at your job. Um, it's another to just have to make hard decisions for call related reasons. Sure, 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 sure. I, but I, I, mean, I mean, I thought it was super super like makes him more likable to see this side of him yeah yeah he's he, and and i like like it also goes goes away to like explain like we we have this idea of gunslingers as knights and we have this kind of nebulous idea but we've never outside of roland we never we've never seen like a gunslinger in their prime it's kind of like how we didn't see jedi knights in the prime of jedi knightdom we just had in the original star wars we just had obi-wan and then eventually luke so we didn't quite understand it but um we get through here a, an understanding of how much respect he has just for the idea of them. These guys aren't gunslingers, right? Like not like technically they're beat cops. They're like two like 
kind of overweight asshole beat cops that were making homophobic jokes when they first saw Jack Mort um, back when he first walked up to the gun shop. Um, and yet in, in Roland's mind, these are gunslingers and therefore they deserve respect as gunslingers. And therefore the only logical explanation is I must have scrambled their brains a little bit when I smashed them together. They couldn't have been this stupid on their own. They could not have been. My code does not allow for that because they're gunslingers. Yeah, it's uh, it's, it's interesting because it's almost I mean, we have this idea of what a knight is. But now I'm almost thinking more along the lines of like a samurai just because that's an even more sort of stylized, at least, you know, the popular understanding of what a samurai is. You know, and I know it's not really exactly right, but this idea of of this strict warrior code where they're 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 not quite a cop they're not quite a knight they're sort of something else and i mean he he is part yeah. of the noble ruling class which is which yeah. is what a knight or a samurai is um so it's 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 definitely something more than a cop though in his mind yeah yeah i agree i agree um but roland easily disposes dispatches both cops because they just charge into the pharmacy like idiots and <laughs> i love how he dismisses them he knocks them out and says to them, one of them, you're a dangerous fool who should be sent west. You have forgotten the face of your father um, and, and forgotten the face of your father is a phrase that we've heard multiple times throughout this book. But I think this is really the first time it's used in this manner. And it's just fucking great. Like we, I talked to you, I talked to you way back in The Gunslinger about how Stephen King invents a lot of phrases to use in this book. And the reason why um I think I think you might have noticed, Matt, that amongst the Dark Tower community, people like to repeat these phrases a lot. Uh -huh. And that's because they're cool as shit. They're, they're cool as shit. And he, and he makes them cooler by using them in moments like this where yeah. um, I, I, I distinctly remember the moment when I was I was I was walking to lunch um, while listening to this book. And this this scene happened. And, uh, you know, it's just so awesome that this like this huge grin came across my face as i'm as i'm walking and i'm just like oh this is so fun you know mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and and of, of course um i've memorized this and i plan to use it on anybody who crosses me in the future i mean it's such a great insult and like the people don't even know need to know the context to be insulted by it right i feel like if someone looks at you disapprovingly and says you have forgotten the face of your father even if you don't know where it's coming <laughs> from you're gonna be like oh fuck yeah, it's sort of engineered to actually cut at something important, yeah. regardless of whether it has a cultural context. It's like the it, it, it's powerful. It's metaphorical. It's it like is. it's um because because I mean really they're not saying you've literally forgotten what your father looks like. It's it's no. it's you you have lost touch with your uh with with, with your roots with your yeah. um with your uh with your origin with with what is good in the world or something along those lines yep, yep. Ugh, i love it <laughs> it's so much i love this book yeah. um okay so by the time uh, by this time after he's defeated the cops and then goes back outside jack mort is conscious again and has resumed his constant screaming <laughs> but roland doesn't have time for that shit anymore refusing to lessen his grip on the monster forcing him to take over driving the cab and head to the village. I, I love what he says to Jack Mort here, here. I only have time to say this and everything else once. My time has grown very short. If you don't answer my question, I'm going to put your right thumb into your right eye. I'll jam it in as far as it will go, and then I'll pull your eyeball right out of your head and wipe it on the seat of this carriage like a booger. I can get along with one eye just fine. And after all, it isn't as if it were mine. <laughs> Oh, it's it's so great, and this this idea that Mort knows that he's telling the truth because he's he can't possibly lie to him. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. Like I was saying, Roland's really won me over with this horrible abuse of Jack Mort. Yeah, totally. And like, I don't know why. Like when Roland sometimes talks, like we talked a lot earlier in the book about how Roland talked with a very like uh, sing songy poetic type of way, but this is very curt and very to the point and almost overly descriptive. I am going to put your right thumb into your right eye. Does that matter? Like, does, that, does it matter that it's right thumb and right eye? Does the detail of those things matter? No, it doesn't. But it makes it sting more. It makes it real. Like, it, there, it's almost like an excessive amount of detail to the point where, like, of course it has to be done that way because you're being that specific with it. Of course, I visualize it much more easily when, when I have these kind of details. Right, right, right. Yeah, I love it. 
Um, so in these last few chapters, as, as things are starting to ramp up to our climax, every new section of the chapter, each of these chapters is divided into numbered sections. But each one of these new chapters or sections begin with this quick note of the passage of time in that Eddie's world of just like, hey, the sun's gone down a little bit more. Just don't forget, Roland and Reader, um, that the sun's going down <laughs> slowly yeah. and we're running out of time. And it's just King really just playing with suspense here. Yeah, he's really just ratcheting up the tension and sense mm-hmm. of urgency as we approach the end. And and yeah. really, the, the suspense is, is quite remarkable as we approach the end here. Yeah, because we, we're not sure exactly what's going to happen. Uh, King has hidden Roland's plan from us, really. Like, we, we knew the plan was going to have to involve him getting medicine, but that's really it. Um, and the, the story told us he was going to go to a pharmacy, which of course he was. But we don't know what this part of the plan is anymore. We're off we're off the the radar of of Roland at this point. Uh, we don't know what he's doing. He's heading to the village. What? What? Why? Yeah. Um, all we know is he's running out of time. And it's like, you've got the medicine now. Why don't you just leave? We don't understand yet, but we're about to. Yeah, it's uh, it's great. Because Roland heads to the subway in the village, the very subway station where Mort pushed Odetta years ago. And as he does, two younger, quicker gunslinger cops see them and open fire immediately, striking Jack Mort right in the chest. He is only saved by the silver lighter that he purchased just to suck up to his boss. A doobie move, to be sure. Is this, uh, is this Ka? Is this Ka, Matt? I, I, I mean, uh, yes, um. It's very interesting, of course, because Roland murders Jack in like two minutes. Uh, so Ka intervenes here just to make sure that Roland makes it and, and that he gets his medicine and that he carries out this mission. Yeah. Um, and I think it's also interesting because I feel like this kind of thing would normally feel contrived. Like your protagonist is saved by simple chance. The placement of the lighter had nothing to do with Roland. It's just random. It's it's totally random. But for some mm-hmm. reason, I don't really mind. I, I, and, you know, I, I think if this were some other book with some other storyteller I, and, and this kind of thing happened, I think I might mind. I think I might be annoyed and roll my eyes and be like, ah, that, it's, well, what, what a, how contrived. But I think that the reason why I don't mind here just has a lot to do with the fact that we're just so bought into this scene already. Like, I really want Roland to succeed. I really want Jack Mort to get fucked. And... <laughs> And th- this happening, you, you you fist bump, even though it's not like it were cleverly set up. Like if it, things that are cleverly set up are great. This is just complete, you know, you catastrophe. But it's it's still um, you you still you st- you're still happy. So I think that's fascinating. Yeah. I mean, and, and the reason why I like it, I totally agree with what you said. And the reason why I like it is because it is the very thing that makes Jack Mort a monster that saves Roland here. Why is this lighter in his pocket? Because he bought it. He doesn't smoke. He bought it so he could light up his boss's cigar so he could play the schmooze game to try to get ahead at work. It's the same thought process that leads to him being so successful in the murdering that he's constantly doing. Um, And like, that's so fascinating to me that it is that thing, that nature that Ka grabs hold of to save Roland's life and to save the mission here. I, I don't know. Like that contradiction to me is so fascinating. And the fact that it's like a double-edged sword, right? Ka saves you, but then the lighter lights on fire and you're literally burning on fire. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, you've, you've taken something that I just uh, criticized for being meaningless and random and pointed out that you can absolutely read a meaning and a purpose into it. Um, and I think that's, that's great. I, I, I didn't put that together that way. I think in, in either case, it's it's still the case that uh, once the storyteller has has got you sucked into the story this much, then you'll just give them a lot of leeway. <laughs> no, I agree with that. I agree. That, that's what, like one of the things you and I have talked about so much over the course of our podcasting is the idea that like when a story is working on you, your ability to forgive it for certain things goes way up. Yeah. Like when 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 you start nipping nip, nitpicking a story, um, it is not the nitpicks that are breaking the story for you. It is something else right. that is leading to the nitpicks being elevated in your mind. The story's not working on you, and so you are starting to notice little things that bug you. Yes, Jar Jar Binks is not why The Phantom Menace is bad. Jar Jar Correct. Binks is the thing that you notice because The Phantom Menace is bad. Correct. Correct. Yeah. yeah. All right, cool. Well, uh, Mort is now on fire, <laughs> and Roland doesn't give a shit. <laughs> He's just like, yeah, okay, you're on fire. Um, yep. You're going to have to deal with that. And he 
gets up. He beats up the two cops, rushes down the subway. Um, he starts slowly stripping off his clothing, but not like not like in any real like it's not like he's doing it for the sake of Mort. <laughs> he right. doesn't really care about that. Um, and he stuffs the, the ammo and the drugs in his underwear. I really like this part right here, Matt. Uh, the heavy boxes in Mort's under drawer slammed against his balls again and again, mashing them. Excruciating pain rose into his gut. He jumped the turnstile. A man who is becoming a meteor. Put me out, Mort screamed. Put me out before I burn up. You ought to burn, the gunslinger thought grimly. What's going to happen to you is more merciful than you deserve. What do you mean? What do you mean? <laughs> um, so, first of all, like, the, the damage to his balls, I think, is just, like, King king messes up balls a lot <laughs> like <laughs> like i i'm recall the moment when jake got run over and he feels his balls getting squashed and that's awful and maybe we're connecting that like mort is a, is a pusher jack mort is a pusher and uh, he pushes people and he was trying to push jake and when jake did get pushed his balls got squashed and now here at the end of jack mort's life his balls are getting squashed so it's maybe a little, little poetic justice there a little poetic um, symmetry i like that yeah but i, I just like i love I just love like all of all of it. I love all of it. Like him on fire and like Roland seemingly taking pleasure in this revenge he's getting on this guy and the terrified like lack of knowledge that Jack Mort has. Mm -hmm. And and of course what the gunslinger means to the in answer to his question is he's going to throw himself onto the subway tracks, the ultimate act of revenge. I, I do think like, once again, we have to talk about like King has established Jack Mort as this monster enough to that. I think there is this, this correct and justifiable sense of triumph in what is essentially murder here. Like this is murder. He is murdering Jack Mort, but w I don't think we're supposed to look at this and see the gray morality of it, right? No. Uh yeah, this is one of those things about being bought into the story. There's a lot to be said for being just totally within the frame of the story. Like yeah. at, at at this point, I'm sold that this was the right choice. King had me fully on board with this. Uh you know, Roland saw into the guy's mind. He knows this is how he really is. He knows that he really is a monster. Um, and, and, and so do we, and I was happy to see Jack Moore get killed by train and I can't find any trace of internal conflict about this feeling nope. in, in my soul. And, and really, I mean, I think it's interesting how King has, has really completely played to my sense of justice, even if it's done in this violent and sort of objectively awful way. I think what? it's very old Testament. Mm -hmm. Um, we've got an eye for an eye here i mean he did just talk about popping out one of jack's eyes so maybe yeah. it's meant to be taken as such and and he doesn't just kill jack because he could have done that at any point basically mm -hmm. he he pushes him in front of a train the same train where he gets yeah. cut to pieces and I mean, yeah it's bloody vengeful old testament shit it's really right up roland's alley and uh, i mean right up king's alley too i think and yeah. I mean, it's, there's a reason why the Old Testament was popular in the first place. This sort of <laughs> bloody, bloody vengeance really appeals to our nature as as people. Yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, it's it's designed to make you feel good about it because you're like, fuck yeah. And and look, I I am glad we live in a society where this is not done anymore. But that's the beauty of fiction, man. You can just like feel great about how you don't feel bad about this. <laughs> yeah yeah we we read a lot of books that have a lot of ambiguity and gray and it's nice to just be like yes it's good that this happened yes i have no qualms with this at all yeah, yeah. totally so uh, w one thing we didn't mention is as roland launches jack mort's body in front of the train he is psychically screaming towards detta which works um we don't really understand why it works but it does work and detta looks into the door just as Roland has Jack Mort turn to look into the door and Detta sees Odetta and Odetta sees Detta and there is this struggle that we've been building to for half this book now a war and holy crap Matt it's so good <laughs> it's so mm -hmm. good I love this like they see each other and they immediately start strangling each other the woman was trying to kill her, but the woman was not real, no more than the girl had been real. She was a dream created by a falling brick. 
But now the dream was real. The dream was clawing her throat and trying to kill her as the gunslinger tried to save his friend. The dream made real was screeching obscenities and raining hot spittle into her face. I took the blue plate because that woman landed me in the hospital. And besides, I didn't get no four special plate and I bust it because need, it needed busting. And when I saw a white boy I could bust, why I bust him too. I hurt the white boys because they needed busting. I stole from the stores that only sell things that are four special to white folks while the brothers and sisters go hungry hungry in Harlem and the rats eat their babies. I'm the one, you bitch. I'm the one. I, I, I kill her, Odetta thought and knew she could not. She could no more kill the hag and survive than the hag could kill her and walk away. They could choke each other to death while Eddie and the Roland, really bad man, one who had called them, were eaten alive down there by the edge of the water. That would finish all of them. Or she could love slash hate let go. Odetta let go of Detta's throat, ignored the fierce hands throttling her, crushing her windpipe, instead of using her own hands to choke. She used them to embrace the other. No, you bitch, Detta screamed, but that scream was infinitely complex, both hateful and grateful. No, you leave me alone, you just leave me... Odetta had no voice with which to reply. As Roland kicked the first attacking lobstrosity away, and as the second moved in to lunch on a chunk of Eddie's arm, she could only whisper into the witch woman's ear, I love you. For a moment, the hands tightened into to a killing noose and then loosened. So let's talk about this forever, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> let's talk about this forever. I mean, the writing is beautiful, first of all. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a beautifully set up and beautifully satisfying moment. And and I think the meaning of it to me is maybe the most interesting thing, mm-hmm. thing I want to talk about the most. This idea that you have this woman who was cut into spiritually and physically um, and the halves of her one of them is is almost um almost naive in the degree of her um uh 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 what what's the, the word is right out of reach um integrity and 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 like positive mindedness about about human nature like she's and then the other the other half is hateful vengeful spiteful furious full of full of rage and and anger and viciousness and vengeance and the the synthesis of them it's not saying like i don't i don't need to be angry and spiteful it's saying that part of myself is part of myself and i love yeah. that part and i'm bringing it into me and this is me and i am i have this sense of justice and integrity and i also have this hate and anger and this is me yeah. And, and and I think this is really cool. It's a really cool thing to have in this story that is about these characters, particularly like Roland, who has this sort of dichotomy to him where he both wants love and wants this sort of brutal, uncompromising vision of the tower, this, this synthesis of things which are almost irreconcilable but are somehow reconciled within one person. Yeah, I, I, I love that. And I, I totally agree with you there. I, I think it's such it's such a powerful key to what this whole book is doing. And, we, you know, we've talked about so much about Detta and Odetta and what they represent, why the why King wrote these characters as black women struggling in time of the civil rights. And, and we've got some answers to our discussion question from last week. They're going to go over this again. But I think here at the end of the story, it makes this textual like like Detta is a version of Odetta that is struggling with the same things that she is. Like remember at the, when we first met the two of them, that one of the first things that's what's said is that Detta didn't give a shit about the movement, AKA the movement for civil rights, but she is fighting for the rights of black people in, in her own way. It's just a violent, destructive way, right? Like, I, I hurt the white boys because I could. I stole from the stores that sold to the white people because I could while the brothers and sisters go hungry in Harlem and the rats eat their babies. Like I was taking revenge on these people while you were sitting in a jail cell. Um, I, like, and it's too, it's like, it's kind of like, and I, I don't want to oversimplify this because like these two men were infinitely more complex than the pop culture view of them has made them. But it's kind of like the Malcolm X uh, MLK dichotomy of fighting for civil rights right um it, it, again very simplified i i am not an yeah. expert scholar of either of these men and i don't want to pretend that i am but in popular culture one is seen as the calm like peaceful uh 
fighter and other is the the more reactionary i don't want to say violent because violence not right i don't think malcolm x was violent but more willing to to more extreme more willing to push it type of thing um and and again that's not totally accurate but I, I like it as that kind of that dichotomy there. I think it's really fascinating. Yeah, I, I like that. Um, I think that the, the most succinct way I can put it is that is that Deda is interested in in vengeance, and Odetta is interested in justice. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think ultimately, the, like what makes it a, a fun synthesis is that it's absolutely natural for everyone who's been wronged to want vengeance. Yes. Um, but. We, we all hope that the better angels of our nature push us toward actually pursuing justice. Yeah, yeah. But, but <laughs> King, King is saying you need both of those things. Like, and, like yeah. this is happening in a moment when, when Roland just took a vengeance for Odetta. So yes. like, you can, like you are not whole without either. J- justice cannot exist without vengeance and vengeance cannot yeah. exist or, without justice. Or, or you say like, it's, like it, it's, it's a kind of inert conception of justice if you... If you know, if you don't actually feel better after you get justice, maybe. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fascinating, I, and I love that love is what wins the day here. That her love of that part of herself, her embrace of that part of herself, that that wins the day. And um, Susanna Dean is born, and I got to tell you, Matt, you know how many times I did a control find throughout these last five scripts to make sure I was not writing Susanna down <laughs> instead of Detta or Odetta. It was a lot. It was a lot. Uh, yeah, it was very I, difficult. I believe. I mean, assuming this character is going to go on to be like the crucial, the crucial character for the rest of the story, um, I can imagine that. <laughs> it was tough. It was tough. I've, I, uh, yeah, yeah. But yeah, this this moment is is just. Oh my god, it's just wonderful. Um, it's sort of the so, climax, right? Yeah, basically, basically, this is the climax. This is this is there, and and that's why you know we go back to that name, the drawing of the three, and what it means. Um, it, this is the climax. It seems to indicate that these were the three: Odetta, Detta, and then Susanna. Yeah, yeah, I, I like that. I like that. So while Roland is trying to help Eddie with the lobstrosities, uh, they're both too weak to actually stop them, and they're losing. And then the combined Odetta and Detta, who we haven't actually been named yet, but we'll learn soon, uh, ends up saving them, using the last of the possibly spent gun shells to kill and chase off the lobsters. Um, I, I, like I, this is this is I think the last moment in the story because Roland just brought two hundred shells back with him. <laughs> this is the last moment in the story in which the concept that was set up in the very first chapter of this book with the wet shells that we weren't sure of were going to fire or not. It, it, this is the last time it's brought up, and I think it's just it's a great culmination of that beat that's been carrying us through the novel, right? Like this is the end of the book, and this is the end of the uncertainty of the shells. And here, um, they they save the day. Once again, they fire yeah. when they needed to. It's very, it's a nice multifaceted resolution. It's very satisfying. He's got his medicine. He's got his shells. Mm-hmm. He's got his three. We're, we're good. We get to feel happy about this for five minutes mm-hmm. before the next book starts. And I guess we're probably not going to be happy again because <laughs> that's how stories work. Sure. But um, yeah, so it's interesting to me that the name Susanna wasn't set up at all. Like we, we never knew this was Odetta's middle name. I, I, I searched for it. I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure it's not in there. No, it's we, not. Yeah. We do have the name Susan, though, right? Um, yes. The girl, the girl who waited at the window, Roland's true love, I suppose. Um, mm-hmm. So that that similarity in the name seems important, although not in a way where I'm like, oh, were they the same person? No, they're obviously not the same person or anything like that. But it does seem interesting that the names are are similar. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, it's 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 a cool comparison, and I think uh, I think we'll see if the book does anything with that in the future. Yeah. Right. Right. So this chapter ends on this wonderful line. Who are you? He hussed as the darkness deeper than night began to take him down. I am three women. He heard her say as it and as it was if as she was speaking to him from the top of a deep well into which he was falling. I who was I who had no right to be but was I am the woman who have who you have saved. I thank you gunslinger. Um, I, I love that. I don't I don't know if she knew he was a gunslinger. So there's some like, there's some power to that. Yeah, there's some there's some magic. I mean, the way she's speaking right now, this isn't how Detta speaks. This isn't how Odetta speaks. No, this no, is a this kind is of this is a almost almost kind of the same tone as the there are other worlds than these, where it's like, well, where is this coming from exactly? This is very yeah. epic. Yeah, um, it's her ka speaking out. Yeah, yeah. love it. Oh, that's I, I like that. Yeah. 
All right, so now we move into the final shuffle, which is basically the epilogue of the book, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Roland, we start the chapter with Roland saying, for the first time in forever, he's not thinking about the Dark Tower. They're in the middle of a forest clearing. They've gotten off the beach. They're hunting deer, and Roland is is recovering from his infection. The the medicine is working, and they're hunting for meat, for Mm -hmm. meat, and it's great. Yeah, um, and I wanted to pull this line out for sure where he's he's uh, drawing a bead on this deer and the text just says he didn't see the woman standing behind him watching with assessing brown eyes. So there's like a lot of stuff I want to say about that sentence. So first <laughs> of all, he didn't see her? Roland? Yeah. Mr. Situational Awareness? Didn't see somebody? Second, standing behind him. I mean, am I wrong in just assuming that this is Susanna? Because like she still needs the wheelchair. The uh-huh. text says she still needs the wheelchair. Yeah. But she's standing. Is that is that a am I, am I reading too much into that? I mean, it's possible I'm just reading too much into that, but Yeah, I think he was just using short firm. Like she's just there behind him. Okay. Like, I don't think yeah. yeah. Because I wasn't entirely like I thought um I actually reread and I was like, wait, did did Susanna like is the magic of joining these two women, did it also magically fix her legs? Uh the answer is no, apparently. But mm-hmm. for a second I thought maybe that had happened. Um, and then, of course, third, I mean, the idea that she is silently staring at him, assessing him, sizing him up, calculating. We see that Susanna is kind of somewhere between Odetta and Detta. She has this calculating, sharp analytical intelligence, and she's, she's I don't know, she's keeping an eye on Roland. And, yeah, and yeah. it, it kind of makes you, it's the, it's the one note, well, yeah, it's, it's one of the notes at the end of the story that makes you a little bit like, oh, where's this going? <laughs> yep, I love all that. It's great. I, 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 I didn't don't think I ever put together the like she got the drop on Roland, which, you know, we've seen Odetta as someone with like eyesight that might be better than Roland Mm -hmm. Roland's. So, yeah, I mean, we're seeing like there is great potential in this woman, Mm -hmm. um, maybe beyond the skill of even Roland. And that's really cool. Yeah. So what the thing I like here is that in what what is becoming a trend in the story, we're introduced to Susanna Dean's name, not directly not like someone saying, this is Susanna. I am Susanna. Here's here's the first time her, her name is used in the story. Two brown hands closed over his one and took the knife. Roland looked around. I'll do it, Susanna said. Have you ever? No, but you'll tell me how. So that's the first time we see Susanna's name in this book. Is that like, this is Susanna. And, yeah. and we go into it afterwards, like in, in a few paragraphs he'll explain who Susanna Dean is and and where her name comes from but we don't get to see it it's just like it's just so funny how this book does it it did it with Roland's name um it's just it's it it cracks me up yeah it's something I never noticed before and now I can't keep I I keep seeing it it is it is fun um because you're curious right you're like well what's what's the new name going to be because it can't be Detta or Odetta yeah um and I like how I think it's interesting how we uh, we don't really get to know Susanna. Like, there's a few no. moments. We see enough to see that she's not Odetta and she's not Detta. We see enough to see that she's distinct. But beyond that, it's just tantalizing. It's just yeah. It's just a, a mystery. Yeah, well, like everything you said, she's intelligent. She's sharp. Like, here in this moment, um, she's has the confidence that she's going to learn how to, like, skin this, this uh, deer that they've just shot, um, even though she's never known she didn't know how to do it before she sees Roland struggling because he's using his weak hand um and so she just kind of takes over and it's like no you'll tell me how and Mm -hmm. it's just like she's gonna be like I think they're setting her up here to be like competent as fuck yes I mean Eddie's gonna be a third wheel here pretty pretty quick (laughs) um yeah well but that's the interesting part right we haven't talked about that yet Matt because her name is Susanna Dean yeah and and nothing uh, other than this idea that they've been traveling for a while and, and Eddie's sleeping next to her and but like we don't see them interact. Mm-hmm. Um, she's basically asleep when we get this this subsequent conversation between Eddie and Roland and and uh, it's what do, I mean, what are we meant to assume from that? I mean, the, 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 the kind of obvious assumption is like, oh, they're together now. But mm-hmm. I don't just want to say, yeah, that that must be it. I, I yeah. don't know. I mean, because it's not like, and then they were married. Right. <laughs> and, like, we don't actually get to see the moment of her picking her name, right? It's it, We kind of zoom to it after the fact. So, like, I mean, did this name come to her? Is Did she 
open her eyes as this foreign person for the first time, and that was just her name in the same way that Detta Walker came out as a fully fl- – like the name that she probably wasn't consciously aware she picked. Was this just like her Ka picking this name for her, and it's just to match her um, – connection to eddie um in in both the physically intimate and maybe spiritual or emotional way as well mm-hmm. I, I i don't know the book doesn't go into that it just kind of drops out on your lap and says yeah d- deal with that <laughs> yeah um i'm super curious about Susanna. yeah me too me too um i mean i know the answers but i'm super <laughs> curious about your curiosity i know exactly what you mean <laughs> <laughs> so and then uh, Roland, uh, he, he forgot about the tower for like 30 seconds and everything was good. And then he goes to sleep and has a dream and it's back to the tower and it's a dream about the tower. The tower is calling it him to it. And, and then we have this moment here talking about Susanna. Once there had been one woman named Odetta Susanna Holmes. Later, there had been another named Detta Susanna Walker. Now there was a third Susanna Dean. Roland loved her because she would fight and never give in. He feared for her because he knew he would sacrifice her, Eddie as well, without a question or a look back for the tower. (laughs) Here we are, Matt, at the end of the story. And despite everything, despite everything that Roland has been through, despite everything that he has done, despite trying to save Jake again when given the opportunity, he still thinks this and he still knows this. And and I, I kind of just want to talk to you like the, the the book ends on this final talk between Eddie and Roland, this talk about love, this talk about the tower, this talk about his quest. And I like I, I just want to make this like a, a free flowing conversation because I read it and I wanted to literally copy paste three pages and put it into the notes. And I was like, I can't I can't do that. I can't do that. But this final conversation between the two of them is so fucking powerful because it's basically like you love me yeah i do i love you and i will protect you and do everything i can but you will never stop right you will Mm -hmm. never stop for the tower and that might mean that we're gonna die and he's just like yeah 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 and and eddie just keeps throwing it in his face and he keeps just not saying anything because he's yeah i mean he eventually says something back but he's just like i I have nothing to say you're you're right you 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 have the right read on me Mm -hmm. and it's interesting because like we still don't really like understand understand but we've seen enough through roland's words and actions that to, like to understand that he thinks the tower is really really this important yeah, yeah. Uh, he thinks that like everything literally everything hinges on this he says more he says there's more than a world to win we don't know what this means exactly but no. at this point i don't know if we need i mean we, i want to know what it means exactly but i don't know if i need to because at this point um, I'm just starting to kind of trust that he might yeah. be right. Like this is, it, it, it means this much. It is worth this much. And, and it, it tears him apart that this is true, but it is true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think there was something you said a little bit earlier and I'm probably going to misphrase it, but something in the effect of Roland has his moral code and then there is the tower and these two things are entirely separate mm. and what that does is when you establish this character as this guy with this pretty strict like warrior culture moral code that is disgusted by a cop maybe potentially shooting an innocent person um it, it kind of means you have to look at the tower as this thing like if 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 he has this such a strong moral code and this is entirely outside of it it must be something so important. You're kind of forced to just, like you said, like believe him. <laughs> yeah, right. Because he's not, um, he's not like not noticing the hypocrisy. He, he yeah. yeah. I, I don't remember the the line or where it is exactly, but he 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 thinks about the idea of like you know I I I basically murdered this little boy, which is which is which is awful. But like that was tower business, mm-hmm. and. And th- these guys have no excuse for being idiots. Um, yeah. And, and so obviously, yeah, it's this whole separate um, religious, magical um, it's burden that yeah. yeah, like it's almost like he wishes he didn't know about it. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, 
there is one positive here though <laughs> at the end of this thing where we're like oh you're still just gonna kill them all he ends the saying you know even the damned love he gently grasps eddie's arm and say even the damned love and i mean we go back to our, that that moment last week or i think maybe two weeks ago where he was like talking about how he didn't think he was capable of loving anymore he didn't think and 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 he didn't want to right like he was afraid of getting attached to these people because he knew what he would do to them and it seems like as we leave this book he has moved past that he still thinks when the time comes he will always choose the tower that is something that he full firmly believe and the book has given us no indication to doubt that at all that he's always going to pick the tower but that doesn't mean he's going to stop himself from loving and and having compassion and and bonding with these people he has made the decision to do that and that's where we leave him in the book he has made the decision he looks at eddie he looks at Susanna, and he says i love these people and yeah. I am I am going to embrace that love I have for these people. And so that gives us a little bit of sense of hope, right? Like when he gets to the tower at the end, he won't be the beast. He won't be the monster because he is allowing himself to love. And that's good. Yeah, that, that's his dramatic arc in this in this book, because, Correct. you know, yeah. when, when he first drew them, he was kind of haunted by the similarities between Eddie and Jake and 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 he looked at them and thought like oh i can never i can never love these people i have to push them away and then he gets to this point of being able to accept that and that's beautiful yep it is and that is the end of the drawing of the three yeah <laughs> that's it we did it that's it um there's this one rather silly and anticlimactic thing i want to mention sure <laughs> which is the the phrase money talks and bullshit walks uh some form of this okay. some form of this line comes up four times in the book Oh, wow. I, I just I think it's a great phrase. Uh, I think it's fun how he manages to work it into his speech at the end because uh, Ed, Eddie brings it up yet again in the speech at the end. Um, it's, I mean, it's really just another way of saying, like, put your money where your mouth is or even just put up or shut up or talk is cheap, that kind of thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting that we have so many English sayings that mean the same thing, which is basically to say actions speak louder than words, which makes a lot of sense because Roland is all about action and he doesn't mince words. And sort of a good motto for this group of people. So yeah, yeah. Um, I, I it, it's a very you know it's a very uh, 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 salty New Yorker way of phrasing it, but I think it's 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 more than just like flavoring that he's putting into this um, this story. I love it. I love it. <laughs> That's great. I, I I did not connect those together, but you're that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for throwing that in here <laughs> at the very end. I love it. You're welcome. Do you have any speculation before we move on? Any anything new? Uh, we can maybe circle back around to this next week as we kind of wrap up the book. But um, I'm curious where you think the story is going to go from here. Um, phew, well, yeah, no, I don't have. I, let's I mean, just, let's just th- you take the week to think yeah. about it, and we'll circle back to it next. I week. think that's a good idea. Yeah, cool. All right, uh, let's do our audience question of last week. The question was, how does Deda's sense of justice differ from Odetta's? And I think the book kind of answered this question <laughs> for us, but I do think we got some great points from uh, a few people here. So um, first up, we have an answer from Megafire7, and in true Megafire form, he wrote a very, very long, long answer to this. Uh, I'll try to, to read some of the, the, the parts I like here. Um, I love when he talks about Detta here where he says Detta is hatred. Detta is poison. Detta is violence. Detta is every single time you felt like you really just wanted to fuck someone up, ruin their goddamn day. When Detta feels wrong, she refuses to turn the other cheek because fuck you. Turning the other cheek just gets you slapped a bunch of times instead of once. Detta will not take your shit. And I think that fits with what you were talking about, Matt, with this, this like this kind of this revenge incarnate. Um mm-hmm. And she says she's visceral and above all else, she's meanness distilled. And and they say, I think it is this meanness that is important to her capacity for violence. She's not beyond passive resistance, if that's an option that will most ruin that asshole's day. And she's perfectly willing to hurt herself if it means hurting the other guy more or even a little at all. I, I really like that a whole lot. Yeah, um, there's one thing maybe I, I I don't remember if we talked about it or not, but the idea that Roland is is always like, gosh, she's just awful. She is evil. And it's like mm-hmm. a lot of these qualities are things that you also do, Roland. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah, uh, I mean, like, and it's it's so great to me because, like, we have this woman that throughout much of her section, Roland describes as evil and monstrous. And then the book introduces us to a real, actual evil monster. And and while I'm not going to excuse the bad things that Detta does, certainly not, but as you said, comparatively, she's a saint. 
Yeah, right, right. Yeah, good answer. Good essay. Yeah. Uh, Rebecca B has, um, I think, a take that I I didn't see, but I'm really int- I'm kind of into it. Um, they yeah. say they say neither neither Deda nor Odetta seem to have much of a sense of justice at all. Uh, Odetta goes through quite a lot uh, at um, Oxford Town, and uh, in fact has dealt with much more injustice throughout her life. But she never dwells on the need to right those wrongs. And while she may be upset about it, her mind never dwells on the punishment uh, for their behavior. Mm-hmm. Even even in the conversation with Eddie about the cab driver or, or the brick when she was younger, never once does it seem to cross her mind that the transgressors need to be brought to justice. She has a goal, and that is her only focus. On the other side, Detta herself is very much a creature of vengeance and anger. Uh, vengeance and justice are two very different animals. Even if one wants to contri- uh, attribute her ghoulish behavior to her falsified memories— she still doesn't ever seem to think that the people are supposed to answer for their transgressions in a manner that we consider justice. Her own goal, either revenge or just plain violence, is not even for those that committed the atrocities. Um, uh, is not even for th- for those that it- that committed the atrocities, b- yeah. b- but rather an attempt to make herself feel just as dangerous and deadly as the white boys that attacked her. Yeah. So it's kind of more about self empowerment. Yeah. Um, yeah. But- no, I-, I I like that a lot. Yeah. This is this is really interesting. I mean, they say TLDR, Odetta and Detta do not have a sense of justice, and that is what makes them, or rather, Susanna, the right stuff to be a gunslinger. Hmm. Definitely reminds me of uh, Stephen Deschain's uh, comment about morality being <laughs> <laughs> yeah. unimportant. <laughs> right, yeah. I, I, like, I like her parts about Odetta the most, because I think when I originally read that first sentence of the thing is like, Odetta doesn't have much of a sense of justice. No, that's not right. She certainly does. But I think Rebecca gives, it's a really good point here. Like she is broadly interested in the justice of civil rights for black people, right? Like that is broadly the thing that she has committed her life to, to the point where she's willing to embarrass herself. Um, But like, yeah, on a individual micro scale, she does seem utterly uninterested in that. She is not interested in in specifically the policemen who wronged her in this way. She is not interested in the person that that hurt her, that pushed her, or or that uh, dropped a brick on her. Like those concepts are nebulous and independent. There's no specificity there. Like I am not searching for justice for myself. I am broadly searching for this lar- like this wide justice for people of my entire race. Um and it, it is it's interesting. I, I never really picked up on that, but I think yeah. there's something there for sure. Right. I mean they pull out, they say, um Roland's father comments that revenge is a far more no- noble reason to do one's duty than a school book idea of justice. Mm-hmm. That's a fantastic connection. I yeah. b- really appreciate you you uh, handing that to us, Rebecca. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for drawing that. That's that's really wonderful. I love it. I love it. All right, last but not least, we have Sarah Penguin who says, at first it might seem like Detta is fueled by vengeance-focused justice in opposition of to Odetta's reform and improve society justice, but she has no sense of justice at all. She steals and breaks her aunt's plate, which is not really revenge as her aunt has done nothing wrong. While her aunt is described as a non-skin tone blue as her mother's sister, she is presumably the same race as Odetta slash Detta. Yeah, that's probably true. While the frat boy does use slurs after he's attacked, there is no indication that she knew he was racist before that or that she she had any reason to target him. If she had gone after the brick thrower or the man who pushed her in front of the train, that, that revenge might seem more plausible. She steals a $1.99 scarf and later cheap costume jewelry. Unless Macy's has some sordid past I'm not aware of, there's no reason for her to target the store if she wanted revenge, even if there is a scarf that won't do much to hurt the, the store. Detta is violent and a thief for the sake of being petty and spiteful. Um, I, I like that a lot because I think we see in this chapter that that there is some revenge tied to these acts, right? She she outlines the, that revenge for us, but to Sarah Penguin's point, it's ne- like like Odetta's um, broad sense of civil rights. Detta's has a very broad sense of revenge. It is not the specific people that wronged her. It is incarnations of the specific people the blue woman did not cause odetta to have a brick dropped on her head it's just it was during her wedding it was her fault that they were out there and therefore it is her fault and i'm going to punish her for it um it it, it is not 
these white men that hurt her specifically, but I'm going to punish whatever white men I can get because I can. Um, Macy's didn't like to their point, like Macy's is yes. Like, especially in this time, like a store for white women to buy shit at. But like, that is not specific targeted injustice to her. It is broad. Just like Odetta's is broad. That's really interesting. I'm yeah, I'm kind of working through things because I feel like, Part of this is that sh- is that these attacks on her really did just seem like random, sourceless violence. Like, how how is she? How could she even Im- imagine? L- l- like, do you think? Do you think if Detta, if somebody had given her Jack Mort's name, do you think she would have gone after him? Or, or is, I don't she, know. is she genuinely not interested in that? Like, yeah, I, I don't know. I think that's. An, I think the fact that we can even ask that question and not just be like, oh yeah, she'd she'd kill him, is, is interesting. Yeah, I mean, and and at the end there. Jack Mort's death, I might be misremembering, but I don't think they see Jack Mort. And they do, it's, it's not that this connection happens at the death of the person that, co- that created them. I mean, it's poetic in that way, but it's not like they knew it was Jack Mort. They, I think it specifically says they would have no way of knowing that. So their creation in, internally to them has nothing to do with revenge on Jack Mort. It is just a poetic kind of revenge in Roland's mind. Mm-hmm. He's creating them together by destroying the one that made them, um, which is his own sense of justice and revenge, but it has nothing to do with them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it, they, they seem indifferent to it. Yeah. It, it really, it really is Roland being a gunslinger and, and yeah, uh, yeah I think that's, I think that's yeah. uh, really interesting. Hey, hey, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, isn't, like like Jack Mort is not doing these things in a racially targeted way, right? Like Correct. Th- th- that's an interesting irony that he appears to have like gone after her twice, but there's no real evidence that it was racially motivated. It was just like yeah. ra- he is just this random force of, of yeah. evil. I mean, he's probably as racist as any like white dude in 1960, yeah. whatever was. But yeah, I mean, th- there is. Yeah, the book, I think the book makes it very clear that um he didn't drop a brick on her because she was a little black girl she was yeah. just the per and I, and i actually think like there there is once again a more broad sense of injustice here that the reason they're walking is because someone was racist to them because a, a cab came that's up and true. saw they were black and drove away so the cab driver was racist and that's why she got hit with a brick but it, jack mort himself was not acting out of racial prejudice he didn't target her because she was black i don't and i and assumingly therefore he didn't target her because she was black the second time either um it's just he likes he delights in hurting people yeah i think that's uh the, the great point that that she was ultimately hurt because of racism yes yeah yeah okay which i mean explains explains the deep-seated motivation behind it which odetta kind of never understood like like she kind of like saw her entrance into the movement as just like having the world opened up in front of her like she started hanging out in the village and like like first learned about it that way and but i mean i think if we think about it it probably comes back to that root case of it was racism that caused this accident to happen to her. And she, because she is the passive side, she was not able to process that until she was forced to by external factors Mm -hmm. because that's just the way she was. Yeah. That's really interesting. Oh man. Some really great thoughts about Odetta and Detta. Really wonderful characters. Some of my favorite characters in this entire series. I really, I really love the, the complicated nature. And I think the answers to these questions really, really got to why they're so complicated. So thank you all who answered. Really appreciate that. Yeah, that was great. Um, For next week, we are not going to have a discussion question. What we are going to do is at the end of every book, we have one episode that just like goes through the book again and and maybe like tries to grab some big themes and big ideas and just talk about the book as a whole for about an hour. But the other thing we want to do is uh, a mailbag. So just a short question and answer session. If you have questions for us, feel free to ask them. It can be about the gunslinger, about the drawing of the three. Please, folks, no questions about the future books. Uh, I, I won't be able to answer them with Matt standing here. Um, and so we just will have to ignore them. Um, you can ask us, you can ask me about some of my other King stuff, as long as it's not spoilery, because I don't want to ruin those books for people. But uh, try to keep it to Kingslingers and Stephen King stuff. But other than that, 
ask away whatever goes. Um, and we'll try to answer as many of those as we get as we go through the episode. So you can reach out to us on our uh, subreddit. That's r slash doof media. And you'll find the, the thread for this particular episode. And you can leave your answer there. You can email us at kingslingerspod at gmail.com. Or you can write those on the uh, the comment section on our website, doofmedia.com, for that particular episode or on the YouTube link for that episode you can put your your question and you can put your question there so any of that stuff any of that stuff you can do it there cool yeah so that's it for us once again we'll be back next week to talk about uh the last five episodes we're going to look back at the drawing of the free as a whole yeah and um i mean you can reach out to us with really any questions or comments outside of the uh, mailbag questions uh at uh, kingslingerspod at gmail.com or on uh, at doof media on twitter yeah, and if you are not already subscribed to Kingslingers, come on, do it. <laughs> what was what was the phrase again, Matt? Um, what was it? I I forgot it. It was money talks bullshit walks. That's right, money talks bullshit walk. Hey, we need we gotta start saying that. Yeah, <laughs> all the time. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, or pretty much anywhere else you can listen to podcasts. Yeah, and if you like any of our shows and you want to support them, money talks and bullshit walks. <laughs> Uh, consider donating to our Patreon at patreon.com slash doofmedia. Um, if you donate to us at the $5 per month level, then you'll get to hang out with us once a month in our monthly doof and chill sessions, uh, as well as a bunch of other cool bonuses. So go check that out. Yeah, that reminds me. We got to get that thing scheduled. <laughs> yes, we do. Um, if you cannot afford to us, afford to donate to us right now, well, I mean, you've forgotten the face of your father, but that's <laughs> absolutely okay. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, you can help us out by sharing this podcast with your Stephen King loving friends on different subreddits everywhere you can. Please, please, please share us. Uh, we want the more people participating, the more fun it is, the more interaction we get with the audience. And we really, really love that. So please share it. And of course, you can always leave a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or um, if there are other places where you can leave reviews. This week's review comes from listener Curtis WM who gives us five stars and says a good start. I've yet to be disappointed by Matt and Scott's close readings. And this looks to be another winner short and sweet Kurt, but thank you so much. Really yeah. appreciate it. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you everyone who has left rating and reviews. If you've done one, we're, we're going through them slowly. We'll get to yours. We'd like to read them aloud to thank you guys personally, because it, it really means the world to us. So if yours hasn't been read yet, it will get to it, I promise. Um, and that is it for us this week, Matt. We're done, finally. This is the longest episode we've done so far. Awesome. Um, but we will be back next week to recap the drawing of the three. Long days and pleasant nights. And may you have twice the number. Mm-hmm.